And we are live, man. I'm so happy to have everybody here, man. Welcome back. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to do is a live live stream uh, Monday call that we do every other Monday. We do this for all the people who are just interested in maybe learning more about Men of Action, but uh, you know, you aren't part of the, of the program. Or if you just want your questions asked, or it's just one of these things. I actually enjoy doing these. I know a lot of other content creators, they hate doing these live streams because they have to talk to their clients. I love you guys. Literally, this is a labor of love. I want to do this for the next 50 years. I want to do, I want to do some kind of coaching like this until I die. So I love doing this. Those of you who have been part of men of action, you guys know, I still do four. I do 28 hours of one-on-ones per week, actually closer to 40 per week. I'm never tired of doing this. I'm never going to get a too old to do it. So I love it. I love being able to help you guys. I love being able to take, take for you the last 25 years of experience that I've gotten from running a business, from being in the military, from managing a strip club, all the things that I've learned over the last 25 years and being able to pass those things along to you. And I'm also really fortunate in the fact that we've been able to create an incredible environment, a community full of accountability and networking here in Men of Action, where you guys can count upon one each other. And guys, we have a free Men of Action uh, school group. If you guys are interested in going uh, joining that, it's school dot com forward slash men hyphen of hyphen action hyphen free. If you guys want to check that out, we'll put the link down here in the in the comments. You guys are more than welcome to join us. You don't have to be a member of Men of Action to be involved in our events. You don't have to be a member of Men of Action to come on these Monday calls. You don't have to be a, a member of Men of Action to you know subscribe to the podcast and get all that information too. And then eventually someday if you do want to join, we're there for you, but you don't have to be a member to to be a part of all that and to get there we go. Um there we go. What's up, Ty? Uh, Lieutenant Ty Buchanan from the United States Army. He's the one uh, setting that up. We made him a co-host here today. And then we're still waiting. Um, we're, we're still waiting for some other people to come. So here, here's what we're going to do, guys. If you guys have questions, we're going to save those here in a little bit. I'm going to start asking some questions for our guest. And then once we get that thing started, we're going to go ahead and, and keep this thing moving and ask a bunch more questions for the rest of you, okay? Uh, so, But we're going to start off with our guest question. First off, let me go ahead and introduce our guest. Let me make sure he's here real quick. Let me uh, here. Okay, beautiful. My man. This is really great. And let me see here. Got it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Cool. Marshall, if you want to start your video and then I'll bring up Hannah and I'll bring up uh I'll bring up Kayla. There we go. Beautiful. Our guest today, he is a six-time all-pro NFL champion, three-time offensive player of the year, and 2011 NFL Hall of Famer, first ballot Hall of Famer, Mr. Marshall Falk. How you doing today, Marshall? What's going on, Michael? How you doing, man? Good. Really good, man. Hey, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. So there's a lot of guys here that are in like a business mindset. This is kind of nice. a business mindset for a lot of people. And there's some things that I looked at, uh, you know, as far as like motivation, like finding what your true passion is. I was reading a story about you working in the Superdome growing up. You grew up in the Ninth Ward in New Orleans. You were working in the Superdome selling popcorn. Did you grant, did you get a motivation from that? Yeah. Um, well, first, first of all, uh, you know, it was like by any means necessary. I literally, um, that was the only way I could afford to get the game. You know, um, you, you pay 15 bucks to get a rack. So you sell popcorn uh, compared to like a $50 ticket back then. Yeah. So um, a lot easier to get in. Um, you sell, you sell popcorn in the first half. You watch the game the second half. That was my way of getting into a game. You know, that was, that was it. That's the only way I could afford to, to get in the game. So that was one of my first jobs. Actually, my second job, my first job was carrying um, to get the $15. We stood at the grocery store and this was before you could push the baskets to the to the car. Um, we carried the groceries to the car for uh, for customers. So um, some of the first things that I started doing uh, back around around the age of like 11, 12. Um, that's how we made money. Did and you knew you wanted to play football? I mean, you knew that oh, was yeah. your dream back then. Yeah, yeah, I love sports. Period. Uh, but there was just something about football, man. The, the camaraderie that comes with it. Um, in, in team sports, there's no other sport like football. I uh, understand, you know, in basketball, Michael Jordan could dominate. Steph Curry can shoot the lights out. Um, in tennis, Serena Williams, Djokovic. I mean, they 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 can literally win by themselves. In baseball, you can literally go up and affect the game by hitting a home run by yourself. Pitcher can pitch a no hitter, you know, it takes a little help, but he can strike all the guys out. In football, no one thing can be accomplished without teammates. Of it's just you need teammates. 
All right. So Marshall, there's a, there's always a point where like a lot of us get kind of figure out what it is that we want to do for a living for the rest of our lives. And then we kind of figure out that we know that we're good enough. I'm reading a story about, I believe uh, it was your uh, freshman year in at San Diego state. You had 368 yards and seven touchdowns in one game, right? Before that, when you're in uh, high school, you're playing both ways. You were playing corner and you're playing um, uh, tailback. And then also you had six you had six intercepts and returns for a touchdown. They, when you were recruited, they asked you to be corner. You didn't want to play corner. You stayed steady on wanting to play on offense. Can you talk about that? About sometimes, you know, people trying to tell you, you know, Lamar Jackson, they say, oh, you should play running back. Or Tim Tebow, they try to make him a tight end. They try to switch people from different positions. Sometimes in your business, you know what you're good at, but they try to make you do something else. Can you talk about your conviction to want to play offense when these these colleges are recruiting you to play defense? Yeah, understanding that you know you better than anybody. And what, what I knew about me was that um, I had the most fun with the football in my hand. <laughs> I'm like, okay, there's two positions I can play. I can play quarterback, I can play running back. Uh, back then, um, you know, court, quarterback wasn't as sexy of a position. Uh, you, you were only throwing the ball, what, you know, 15, 20 times a game. The running back, he got the 20, 30 touches, carries. Um, football was built around uh, running the football. So that's what I wanted to do. And and I, and I didn't know, I didn't allow the noise, the outside noise to to tell me that what I was doing was was wrong. I, um, a lot of people, you know, they get in the, in the, in the head space of, you know, I'm going to fail the way I want to fail. I was like, no, I'm going to succeed how I want to succeed. And that's how I looked at it. I just, I, I knew football in my hands, carrying the football. That's why I was most happy. Uh, I played corner because we needed a corner. Yeah, I was one of the faster guys on the team. I didn't enjoy. I didn't. I never wanted to hit people. You just wanted to avoid getting hit. That's it. Make a miss. Make a miss. <laughs> that's the fun part. Okay, so the other thing that's very unique, you're the only player in NFL history with 12,000 receiving yards and 6,000, I'm sorry, 12,000 rushing yards and 6,000 receiving yards. Your, your junior year in college, you start catching the football. In the NFL, five times during your career, you led your team in receptions as a running back. Can you talk about like this dynamic? Did it, Was it something where you just realized, even in the Super Bowl, you had 90 yards receiving is this something that you just kind of figured out this is another way, or is this something you just love to do? Did you want to play wide receiver? Was it something like that? You know, um, every time this topic comes up, uh, yeah. people look for some elaborate story. And uh, I feel like um, when I when I say what I have to say about this, it's like, oh, you, you literally think about it. Um, but my answer to this question is, um, they always talk about running backs can't catch. And I, and, and I just don't understand how someone could get into football and not know how to catch. The reality is this, the essence of football, the first time you get introduced to the football, someone's throwing it to you and you're catching it and you're throwing it back. How the hell do you not know how to catch? Yeah. I, I don't even, it, it blows my mind. Everybody that started with football, someone tossed you a ball, you caught it, and you threw it back. How do you not know how to catch? It's, it's, <laughs> it's, and then we marvel over, oh my God, he caught the ball. Well, well shit, that, really? Yeah. <laughs> but um, I worked out with the receivers. That's what I did. Yeah. Receivers and cornerbacks are the most conditioned people in the game. And and what I did was I trained with the I trained with the receivers. I trained with the court, I, I trained with the cornerbacks. And that's, if you want to get in shape, they're always running, always running. Yeah. What was your, uh, what was your favorite route out of the backfield? Um, you have something where you just knew a third down, there's no way they're going to cover this Texas route, this table route. Was there something that you just knew Kurt, Kurt was going to get you the ball? I mean, you know, half of these people don't know Texas table option. They don't know. <laughs> actually, C actually, there's some professional Madden players in, in here right now. They're very familiar with those terms. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, um, literally we, we, we called it the option route. Okay. Uh, and, and for me, I had the liberties to, I, I read the coverage, so they couldn't, he couldn't be right. You know, if you, if you doubled me, I, I split the double and ran the seam. Um, if you played outside, I broke inside. If you played inside, I broke outside. Um, so kind of like know, a stick played, route, like, like Jason Witten, when, like where he, no matter what he did, the, the defender was wrong. 
Yeah, it's just, it's, just, it's option. It was option yeah. for me. So the defense couldn't be right. What uh what is it like playing with a guy? So, you know, Trent Green, he ends up like this is another thing, like believing in your teammates, right? You know, uh, I, I still remember it like it was yesterday. Um, Dick Vermeil saying, you know, we're gonna go with Kurt Warner for the rest of the season after Trent Green gets hurt. And a guy who was a grocer, and guys, it's not an exaggeration, you should look it up. A guy who was grossing, he was packaging groceries, not even yeah. what two or three years prior was was on his way to be a starting NFL quarterback, and then that year became league MVP. What was it like being around Kurt? At some point, were you like, okay, wow, this guy can play, and then later on, like, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. What was your experience like seeing what Kurt's season was like that year? It was, um, you you know, people always the, the, the old cliche terms of uh, when opportunity when when opportunity preparation meets opportunity. Like we were living it, like literally. <laughs> the dude was prepared. He played arena ball. He won at arena ball. He played over in the World League. He wanted to work, run in the World League. Um, and he, I don't know if you guys saw his, saw his movie, American Dream. He um, he went to the Green Bay Packers and he wasn't ready. And they asked him to get in and take some snaps and he wouldn't go in. And he got cut. And he promised to be ready the next time. Whenever, it, whenever he had his moment, he was going to take advantage of it. And he got he got his opportunity and he was ready and it turned into a hall of fame career a guy who was bagging groceries he wasn't even good enough to be a cashier he was bagging groceries for real yeah ended up being a hall of fame quarterback incredible was there anything that you noticed like again i mean i'm i'm sure you've been around a ton of quarterbacks but he seemed to be uniquely accurate beyond anybody i'd ever seen was that something yeah. that you noticed yeah he was uh he was accurate um he was unflappable and uh, one of the toughest football players, like the guy stood in there and he, he our offense was literally based on Kurt. How long are you going to hold the ball yeah. and get it deep? And he would hold on to it for the, to the last minute, throw the deep ball, boom, and take the hit every time, every time. Like it, it just, it didn't matter to him. Uh, but what he was, uh, what he was, was um, the guy had conviction. Like uh, he was a guy who wouldn't, wouldn't scream at you, wouldn't yell at you. Um, just expected you to be, to be where you're supposed to be, where you're supposed to be there. And um, I always tell people the best man I know, like most tolerant, most Hurt. patient, doesn't cuss, won't won't yell, um, you know, gets gets down on himself. Gosh darn it! Like that's the most you'll hear him say. That's his cuss word. That's it. Um, just uh, un unbelievable human being, man. Unbelievable human being. Yeah, that's incredible. And then the other thing is we see it as kind of normal today because teams are throwing the ball so much. But you guys are running three receiver sets almost the entire time. You, uh, oh, Isaac Holt, yeah, Torrey man. Bruce, Azazir Akeem, later on uh, Ricky Prohl. And in those in that offense, it felt like you guys were doing what other offenses were doing. Like, for instance, the Cowboys in the 90s, they're running 10 in a comeback. You guys are like – you have Isaac Holt – or I'm sorry, you have um, – you, know, uh, you have – um. Isaac, Isaac Bruce, Bruce Isaac Bruce, it, 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 Torrey Holt. He's sorry. There's an Ike Holt on the Cowboys. You uh, you running 15 and out, 20 and out. He's running routes at depths that like no one was used to. Uh, having an all world at left tackle at Orlando Pace probably helped, but like the the ability you guys were stretching the field in a way that nobody had ever done before, which probably I'm guessing opened up uh, opportunities for you underneath to you know lead your team in receiving. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I benefited from having. Having Isaac and Tory, Oz, Ricky, um, you know Tony Horn, uh, like those guys made it a lot easier on me. Uh, obviously, you know I, I did I did some pass blocking for them, but when I got a chance to go out on routes, um, if you were going to blitz us, then you had to deal with me one on one with a corner or safety. Um, you 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 took your chances. Um, and we, we we revolutionized the game. Like, we changed the game. The game of football, how you guys watch it now, uh, with the pass first, that was us. Literally, yeah. we, we we did that. And you couple that with all the rule changes. Um, you know, when we were doing this, there was no illegal contact. <laughs> you know, when we were doing this, there was no defenseless receiver. When you went across that middle, Ray Lewis could lay hat on you, whether you yeah. had the ball or not. They could, they could pick you off and knock you down. It, it's just, it was a different game. And so watching it being done today with the rules that they have now, it just looks unfair. 
Yeah. At first it seemed kind of strange, but now I'm so much, do you, I, I don't know if you remember Anquan Bolden who laid, later played with Kurt Warner uh, with the Cardinals broke his jaw. He got hit in the head and they broke his jaw and it wasn't even a penalty. And when you see that kind of stuff, it's and also when you go back and you think about like Kurt Rambis getting clotheslined, you know, in the playoffs, and then it was just a regular play on foul. It wasn't even a technical. Like that's how the, the world has changed. But I think it's definitely a lot better, uh, you know, where you have the issue of a defenseless receiver because, man, guys were getting lit up. It was bad. I remember Darren Woodson sending one guy to the hospital. Like stuff like that was – it was really bad. And I th I feel like these there's a lot more scoring, and you get to keep guys for longer in their careers because of the way the rules are set up now. Yeah. No, it's it, definitely to protect guys. And any time you put a rule in, what, what happens is um, – some way, somehow, people learn how to circumvent the rules. Yeah. And, and, and what they do now is they just run guys through the middle of the field as fast as they can and then trail them with another guy. Because the defense, get if you, yeah. if you hit him, it's a flag. If, if it looks bad, they're throwing the flag. Yeah. <laughs> if it crazy. looks bad, they're throwing the flag. It just they, they can't have it look bad. Is there anybody in the NFL right now that you would compare to yourself that reminds you of you? Oh, I mean – Put it like this: If you can't, if you can't play all three downs, your your career is short. Like when I look at Derrick Henry, I'm like, it's because he don't play all three downs. Yeah. Every every back that's playing, Saquon, Christian McCaffrey, um, all, all the guys, all the you you have to play all three downs, and you got to be serviceable in the passing game, whether you're picking up blitzes or you're you're coming out of the backfield catching a ball. It's just it's it's not okay to be a first and second down back. Those guys don't get drafted anymore. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think of Christian McCaffrey probably the closest because of the way he he's able to catch the ball like a third down receiver and at the same time run between the tackles. That reminds yeah. me a lot of, of the way you played. Well, more of more of the, the the volume and output. You know, he's playing he's playing whole games. Like yeah. if they have eighty plays, he's playing seventy five of the plays. He's not a guy that that's playing you know twenty thirty plays a game coming out you know, splitting time. No, he's carrying the load. That's awesome. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, one other thing I want to ask you about, this kind of deals with other people because a lot of us have, we switch from one job to another. We have a contract negotiation. Ours aren't in the national news. You had one <laughs> where you're traded from the Indianapolis Colts to the St. Louis Rams and you hold out for 12 days for your new employer and end up signing a $45 million deal. Do you have any advice that you have come looking back from that? Obviously, most of us aren't dealing with that level of pressure, but like standing firm, you know, knowing what you're worth, that kind of thing, advice that you were getting from your agent. What what was that uh, experience like? Well, it, it was an advice that I was getting from my agent because I was I was I was talking to guys on the team, um, whether it was Ty Lye, uh, Isaac Bruce, and I was letting them know, like, I know I'm holding out and you guys want me there, but I'm doing this for you guys. Because once once they pay, once once you you have someone, you bring somebody in the fold, and once they paid me that contract, if you look, Kurt got paid, Isaac got paid, Orlando got paid, like guys started getting money on the team once it because that 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 starts to breed competition. Mm. Other people want your players, and now you see the value in your players. So essentially it led to other people getting paid on the team. And and what you have to do is you have to focus on your job and what you do and 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 stay out of the business of other people's money. Was it uh was any of it ever personal? Did you ever Always. feel like it was it was personal? Always. So Always either, personal. so so them the Indianapolis Colts drafting Edwin James and then you getting traded to St. Louis. Was this something where you just wanted to prove it to them every time? I, I listened to Charles Barkley. He talked about when he got traded from the Sixers to the Suns. Every time he he went and played the Suns, he tried or the Sixers, he tried to put it on him. Was it like that? Or for you, was it just, just business? This was just a personal thing. Oh, uh, it was personal. Uh obviously it's business, but but it's personal in in the sense that um, you know, and, and I understood what it was. I, I mean, I was the leader on that team. Um, Peyton and I, we played one year together. And if I would have still been on that team, it would have been hard for 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 them to just follow Peyton. They had to clear it away for Peyton to become the leader that he became, for him to become the guy that he is. Um, you, you just can't have uh, a, a third or fourth year guy. I mean, I've, I've been to three straight Pro Bowls. Um, I put up some really good numbers. So you can't just snatch a team away. Um, and at that point in time, it was it was the position. You know, we came off a horrible year. I think we were like three and thirteen. Mm -hmm. And for Peyton, um, 
I think it was a great move for me and it was a great move for them and for Peyton as well. Like he he got to assume the role of leadership. People looked to him and it it helped to create the guy who he became. Um, so we're going to transition over into like some things to do with finance. There are some problems you see, like the situation with Antoine Walker or Michael Vick or people like that burning through like $100 million. What do you think the delineation is where somebody like, say, um, Roger Staubach, I don't know if you've seen, he's almost worth $900 million from his real estate investments now, right? I believe he's, he's going to be the first former NFL court player who's a billionaire. And then you see some of these guys that just run through all their money. What was the advice that was being given and how did how did some guys figure it out and other guys not? Yeah, uh, I, I'll be honest, uh, you get lucky. Now, unless you, if, if you come, if you come from money and um, most guys that play football, they don't come from money. Football, as I told my kids, is not a rich kid sport. Once you start getting hit, you, you decide like, do I really want to play? <clears throat> in basketball, they call fouls when you get hit. In baseball, you never get hit. It's just, it's it's not a, it's just not a rich kid sport. So we don't come from money. And, and and the question is, the minute that you get this contract, what happens? Who do you, who, who's going to give you advice? You have to turn to someone who you don't know, you don't trust, and get advice from them. Um, the issues are, they're, 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 they're the same. And you have to remember, back then, we didn't have Google. We didn't have YouTube. We couldn't go watch stuff about <clears throat> different products and services and stuff like that. We literally, um, man, it, it was like, if you got the wrong financial advisor, you were out for the slaughter. You, yeah. you could get taken advantage of. Uh, there was no, there was no way to go assume financial literacy. And back then the NFL weren't vetting financial advisors, putting them through a process before you, you, you have to go through a process before you work with the kid. None of that existed. Um, it was, it was hard. It, it was definitely hard. And, uh, the best advice that I got was, listen, if you want to make sure you keep some of your money, hire two people and have them watch each other. And that's what I did. I wow. had two financial advisors That's a great and I had this one looking at these statements. I had this one looking at these statements and they got to give me the rapport about each other and what they were doing. And here's what happened. The person who gave me the best information and who made me the most money got whatever bonus money I made each year. Oh, wow. So they had a reason to compete. That's incredible. That is, that is really smart. Checks and balances, having them look back at each other. Uh, there's a lot of guys that are on this call also right now that are watching us that are content creators. A lot of a lot of times we get a ton of criticism. And I just wanted, I want to ask you about like one thing that happened, uh, the Heisman Trophy vote, where Leo Lee Corso leaves you off of his ballot and he votes for Gino Toretta, which you guys all remember Gino Toretta. No, you don't. Uh, do you, so he ends up winning the Heisman Trophy over you, Marshall Falk. But like the thing is, Leo, Lee Corso doesn't even put you on his ballot. How was it something like that? I was just I just finished Patrick Bet David's book. It's a fantastic book, Your Next Five Moves. And he talks about internally you can maintain these these chips on your shoulder. Externally, don't even re respond. But internally, it's still when you want to go for a new bench press max or when you need motivation to get out of bed every morning. How did you deal with something like that? Because that seems pretty blatant. Uh well, let's I'll, I'll go back to to Lee. Um yeah. obviously uh and and I found this out once I got into television. Uh, Lee had a job to do. And, 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 and now I know this, you know, working in television, when we get ready to prepare for a show and we're doing a show, we literally, they give us topics and it's like, Hey, Marsha, you got to make the case for this guy. Uh, Hey, Michael, you got to make the case for it. And we got to make a case for the guy. Like we literally, if it don't matter if we, who we really believe is going to win or who we really believe in, you just got to make case for TV. It's just, you got to create content, you know, to use the words, um, and, and, and that's what it was all about. But before then, I hated the man, literally. Like, I, I, I think probably the best thing that happened for me was that I didn't win the Heisman because when I got to the NFL, I was like, they think I can't play? Are you kidding me? <laughs> it was like, really? Like, look at the numbers. Are you kidding me? And, and, and it, it gave me the drive that I needed. Um, and I just always remembered the questions of, oh, he played at San Diego State. It's not Pac-12. It's not Big Ten. It's not SEC. Can he really play? I'm like, listen, man, football is football. Football is football. If you can play, yeah. you can play. And, you know, it it, it stuck with me um, as long as I needed to keep it. Uh, you always want to have those little things that tap into. You always want to have them. Yeah.
Awesome. That's a great piece of advice. Yeah. But like, I think the problem is, is when we react to them publicly, then they kind of can take over us. And that's the issue. That's something I've had to learn the hard way from like, yeah. you know, then it, then it owns you. You yeah, keep that internal. Yeah. In incredible. Incredible. All right. So I'm going to transition. So when you, when you realize that your playing career was over first ballot hall of famer in 2011, you get into television. What were some of the other ideas that you had transitioning out of it? Was it, you were just going to do television Were there investment ideas? What were some of the things that you plan on doing after once your career was over? Yeah. So, um, I had a bunch of investments. I had some things I wanted to do some businesses and I just, um, I wasn't really, I wasn't really interested in it. You know, I started sitting in some of the companies that I own parts of and listening to the meetings and it just, it, it wasn't doing what I wanted it to do for me. I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't really feel the need. Um, there wasn't really a purpose behind doing a lot of the stuff. So, you know, I just, um, I was searching and, and, and here's the reality, you know, um, I, I've been honest about this. Um, we're lost, man. You, you, you know, that, you retire, those curtains closed, cameras like to go off. And you're like, what am I going to do now? What what do I do? What What's going to fuel my fire? And trying to find yourself, is, it's difficult. It's really difficult trying to find yourself. And and that's 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 what a lot of players, um, you know, there's still, well, back then, there wasn't a transitioning thing. So, but now they have, they, they prepare you for the transition of walking out the stage and, and you then, you have an opportunity to, uh, to to find out what you're going to do. And luckily, um, I got asked to come do an audition for television. Um, they'd seen some interviews that I did. And um, uh, I had to, I had a choice to between NFL Network and um, ESPN and NBC. And at that point in time, um, ESPN wasn't doing football year round. And I wanted something to do. I, I needed something to occupy my time. Um and and so I decided to go learn how to do television at the NFL Network because they had football year round. It was football twenty four seven. That's all I was going to do was talk football. So why not go to a place that you can talk football and and learn learn about the game and learn how to talk about the game? And um, it really saved my life. I, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't do that before I transitioned into the real world because that transition going from sports to the real world it's it's hard. It's real. Yeah. Did, what, did you find any, what, the other thing I, I, I highly recommend people do is find mentors. Was there somebody yeah. when you got to the NFL network, was it rich Eisen? Was there somebody who sat you down and kind of gave you a piece of advice? Yeah. Uh, James Brown, I uh, mm. love James. Um, I remember calling him up. I did, I did an interview when we were in the Super Bowl, and he gave me his number and say, if you ever need anything, call me. And so when I was getting ready to make my decision on, on, on where I was going to go, I called James and he said, go to the place where you're going to get more reps so you can get better faster. Mm. And I'm like, well, there's only one, there's only one station doing football 365 days a year. <laughs> That's where I'm going. I'm going to go learn how to get better where I can do an off season. I'm still doing television. ESPN would only do, if you guys remember, ESPN used to only cover the main sport yeah. when, during the season. So they wouldn't cover football when football season was over. Like there was no covering the draft or there was no, well, they, they would cover the draft, but they didn't cover the combine and they didn't do uh, uh, spring train workouts and stuff like that. They didn't do all that until NFL network came around and showed, okay, there's a people want football 365 days a year. And then that's when ESPN started showing football. They came up with NFL live and they started showing football year round. Incredible, man. All right. So from that point on uh, you, you know, you do that uh, as far as, you know, television hosting. Uh, it was awesome. I remember seeing you for years doing that. I'm curious, were there any other still marketing opportunities? Are you still going to do signings? Is like, what, what is oh, yeah. the rest of your time like? Yeah. Yeah. You're still making money. You know, you're still making money. Um, you still have opportunities. Uh, there's a, there's a five-year period, you know, before you, before you get into the hall of fame that, uh, you know, the questions are, is he a first ballot hall of famer? And you're trying to, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to maintain your relevance. So um, I became part of a speaker's bureau. I, I, uh, I got me a, a voice coach and I, I learned how to do, I learned how to become a professional public hmm. speaker, uh, learn how to do all of that stuff and um, got on the circuit, um, started to build a name for myself and, and motivational speaking, leadership speaking, business speaking, um, a business coaching and all of that, all of that type of stuff, consulting. 
uh, and just started to create a brand for myself in that, in that arena. And I was like, you know, it's just pretty cool. Um, but, uh, but, but still, you know, uh, w- was missing some components, you know, was making money, had money, money was doing well, but I didn't know how the money was working for me. I didn't, I didn't really yeah. understand uh, all, all the things around it. Um, I've always wanted to do this. I've done this with uh, Vernon Davis, Terrell Davis, Terrell Owens. I want to show you, uh, if you will, Marshall, I want to show you your card. Hold on, let me see if you can see it here. Marshall, can you see your card? Is it up here? Yes. Okay. Well, so for first impressions, this is the this most recent Madden Marshall Falk card that just came out. 97 speed, 95 of acceleration, 95 agility, 96 awareness. What do you think? Oh, that's pretty good. That's, the card's pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. Yeah, it's pretty accurate. You like it? Yeah. 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 It's awesome, man. Yeah. This card just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago and I just, I've always wanted to show the guys their card. I show Vernon Davis cause he always gets the fastest tight end card in Madden, but yeah, yeah. this one is uh this one's pretty nice. Yeah. It's, cool. it's pretty accurate. Do you, uh, do you, do you guys have a negotiation? Cause you're not in the NFL players association anymore. Do you have a nego? I know once you retire, you have a different negotiation with EA. Do you, do you, are you part of that? Or is that just something that your agent does? No, I'm, I'm part of it. I'm part yeah. of it. I do. I handle most of that stuff myself. Um, I just, I have someone that, that read over the legal documents. Um, I, I, I don't know why lawyers have to talk in that talk. I think it's just to confuse us. Like, why can't yeah. you just put regular, if though, then we must, they, like, why they got to <laughs> put all that mumbo jumbo that crap in there? You know what I'm saying? Just, let's just do a standard contract. But, but yeah, I do all of my own marketing and stuff like that. I majored in business marketing. So I, I understand that terminology and all of that stuff. Yeah, well, but, I also think it, go ahead. Yeah, I said, but but yeah, EA, I'm part of the EA family. You know, Madden cover guy, so I'm a lifer with EA. What was that like being on the cover of Madden? Because you know there's cool. the there's the there's the whole curse thing that happens also yeah. with it. Yeah. Are you nervous about that? No, I didn't I didn't I didn't, yeah. you know, didn't even think about it. But you know, you grow up playing Madden and then you end up on the cover of Madden. I'm like, you know, that's that's like that's it, it, it was trippy. It was like like my friends calling me like, dude, you're on a cover of Madden. I'm like, I am yeah. in the NFL. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. And I think it's also pretty awesome on Ultimate Team. They bring back so recently, greatest show on turf. They just brought back it's uh it's Tori Holt, Isaac Bruce, you and Kurt Warner. The four of you, if you guys all play together, then you also get like a speed boost if you buy all four cards. Nice. So that's another thing that's pretty cool. Yeah, nah, that's pretty dope. That's yeah, pretty dope. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. All right, guys, we're going to open it up uh, to some questions. Marshall, I do want to get into this. You recently, you started working uh, with a financial literacy company. Yeah. And and I want to go over, and we could also bring on um, Hannah, and we can bring on Kayla. Well, I want to go over, what is it that caused you to transition into this field of business? Yeah, man. Um, I, I've always been a person whom uh, you show me something I don't know, and I and I will not run from it. Like, I'm, I'm, I get addicted, and I realized I was introduced to the fact that I was not financially literate. I was like, I didn't have the proper information and education in order to to take advantage of of my money and and to make sure that my money was 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 being taken care of in the right way. And you show me something like that, and I'm 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 all in. And that that's what happened. And 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 once I got the information, I'm like, hold on, wait. There's so many other people out here who don't have the proper information. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot of guys. As we were talking, um, they didn't hire two people. They didn't have the best person. <clears throat> you mentioned a couple of names. Um, if they understood their finances and they knew how money worked, I mean, they probably wouldn't be in a situation. And 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 now. You know, you have uh, you have young kids that's content creators and doing different stuff, and you're making all this money, and you don't really understand. You 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 barely know the tax implications. You 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 you're trusting somebody who's telling you what to do, but that person, that's all he's trying to do is make sure that he keep his job. Yeah, <laughs> you know, trying I to just make saw you the most money. I just saw an article about all the girls on OnlyFans who are not paying any taxes, and like the <laughs> IRS is going to come get you. It's cool. Oh, yeah. Girls like six years, no taxes, making thirty k a month. They're gonna have like a six million dollar tax bill at the end it's of it. Coming. And it's one of these things where you have to go again. I uh, I have a meeting with my account tomorrow, MJ. Uh, and and at first I was like, man, this is how much I pay you. But after I saw how much she helps, I'm like, this is this woman is a godsend. Absolutely, having a good accountant is important. Yeah, and that's how I got into it, man. That's how that's how all of this stuff started to uh, consume me, getting the knowledge, understanding, like, listen, I'm going to work hard for the money. Um, 
I want to spend the money. Why not? Why not figure out how to make the money work for me? Why not? Beautiful. Uh, Hannah, Caleb, you guys want to introduce yourselves uh, and how you guys are involved with this as well. Sure. Yeah, go for it, Hannah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, hi. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Hannah Hornstein, and um, I was actually uh, I was in real estate and mortgage finance uh, about 30 years ago. And um, did that for about four years, you know, helping clients with one of their largest transactions and, you know, working in the finance space. And, um, and a friend of mine invited me to, you know, come to a seminar to learn about how money works. And um, honestly, I had no interest in that. I wasn't thinking about insurance or investments. I thought I knew it all. But through, um, through you know, learning that, that information, I just realized, how is it that I don't know this? How is it that I can work in mortgage finance and real estate and have no clue how to grow my money, how to protect it, um, how to make it last? And so for me, you know, I dove in and 25 years later, you know, I'm, I love what I do. So passionate about helping people and, you know, meeting, uh, meeting Marshall was also very eye opening because I was of the mindset that if you were famous, if you were a celebrity, if you were an athlete, that you had the best money managers and that, you know, you knew everything that needed to happen with your money. And it was, it was eye opening and not just working with Marshall, but, you know, um, we actually ended up working with the NFL alumni association and a lot of the athletes. And we found that this was like really something that was a, a big deal for so many and so, you know, the more, the more we meet people of that status and realize everybody needs this information, um, everybody, I mean, you're on social media and everyone looks like they have a lot of money and that they're having a lot of fun. But in the end of the day, you know, when you get down to like the money part, they're like, yeah, man, I need help. You know, yeah, I need a plan. Yeah. I want to know if, you know, what I'm doing is, is the right thing for me. And there's just not enough people out there that are helping average everyday people, let alone, you know, of course, people that have a lot of money, um, just not a lot of people that are in the financial literacy space. They're in the wealth management space, but not in the actual literacy space. Kayla. Hey guys, how's it going? I'm Kayla. Um, I have been an influencer and a model for most of my life since the age of like 12. Um, I've started many businesses, went to school for business, um, tried and failed through many trial and errors, starting up all different kinds of business and recently was introduced to, uh, Virtuity Financial Partners through Marshall Falk. And, uh, it's been absolutely transformative in my life. I don't think I really ever wanted to face the conversation of financial literacy and what that actually meant. Um, you know, I, I knew I didn't know a lot about it. And so when I met somebody that really did know a lot about it, I kind of just wanted to dive in head first and take control of my own finances and learn. And through that, now I have, you know, I'm growing my knowledge and my base knowledge to teach other people and help other people transform their lives through the knowledge of money. I love it. Okay. Awesome, man. So a couple things. I come from the active investing space. I used to be a trader for a fund and I would sell stock options and I'd take things that are a little bit more risky. And the reason why I want, I thought it was really great to have you guys on is because there are a lot of guys who are part of men of action or come on these calls. A lot of times private business owners, they have a lot of cash that they're sitting on. And a lot of times they don't have the ability to go and look at crypto cycles or try to figure out fundamental analysis or technical analysis. And so they pay someone to do it for them. And so I'm just curious, you guys are, are trying to do financial literacy and have instruments that are more on the safe side of the scale. Yeah, we, we operate in a space of um, a word that, you know, you, you really hear in investing, which is downside protection. Like we are always, we always want to, everybody can make money when the market is doing well, <laughs> but, but are, are you not losing the money when the money's not doing well? That's the thing. Uh, it, you, you don't always have to take a risk uh, to be in the market and to, and to, and to grow. It doesn't have to be risky. Um, I, I tell people diversify your portfolio. Beautiful. Awesome. Uh, I'll tell you what, can we do this real quick? Uh, guys, uh, I need you. I'm going to have everybody, I'm going to lower everyone's hands real quick. I want you to raise your hand again if you have a, a question specifically for Marshall or or Hannah or Kayla. Go ahead and raise your hands again. I know I took some of them off. We're going to go have uh, Tristan come on. James Brown, uh, your mentor, he went to Harvard, didn't he? 
Yes, he's a Harvard That's right. Man. Well, well, Tristan is actually at Harvard right now. He nice. uh, he's one of our lead sales guys. Tristan, you had a question for Marshall. Yeah, man, I I wanted to ask this question all day because I've never really heard anyone ask it before. But what when you guys played the Titans? What was the the atmosphere like on the sideline when uh, Mike Jones uh, tackled uh, uh, Kim Dyson on the one? Like, just oh. what was it like on the sideline when you guys were watching that? And what was, was your reaction when he was one yard short? Yeah, it was crazy. It, it was crazy. Like, uh, I'm, I'm just saying, like, it was um, just chaotic. Uh, the most um, electrifying moment in my sports career, like, Literally, when Mike made that tackle, they blew the whistle, and 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 you saw the hands of the referee go up. Game's over. Did you thought oh he God. made the tackle, or well, you- yeah, because I was I was literally I was on the opposite I was on the opposite forty, and I'm and I'm like I'm on both of my knees, and I'm like and I'm looking down the field, and I just see him stretch the ball out, and I'm I I thought he I thought he got to the to the goal line, yeah, and and when they when they called it, literally. I think I, I I think I ran to the twenty and ran back to the other twenty, uh, just just chaotic, like chaotic, mm-hmm. unbelievable. Uh, and for me, just I'll, I'll take you back. You know, I was um, although I love football, uh, I won I won I I was a champion in every other sport. Uh, I don't care what sport I played, I won. I never won a championship in football, and to have your first championship in football be the greatest of them all, <laughs> it's like that was my moment. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome, man. Cool. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, Ryan. Ryan, what's your question, man? Ryan Henderson? You there, Ryan? I know you're in Australia. Can you hear us, Ryan? Ryan, you got to unmute yourself, buddy. Yeah, you're still muted, Ryan. Okay, so Ryan's having some troubles getting his thing to unmute. I would, I would get off and then get back on. Dawson, what's your question, Dawson? Oh, sorry. My bad. Let's do this instead. Hey, Ryan, try this again. Ryan, go ahead and try it one more time. That's better, Chad. (laughs) Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it, brother. Yep. Um, Yeah, question for Marshall. So um, first of all, great questions. It's really good to you. Uh, Just bear in mind, I'm in Australia, so we don't really watch football or gridiron, um, but really fantastic to um, get the feedback from Marshall there. It's really, really interesting questions um, and answers. Um, So Marshall, my question for you is post-football um, and relevancy. You mentioned you took up public speaking um, sort of once you got out of football to remain relevant. Uh, would you say that um, relevancy is one of the cornerstones to like a man's longevity um, and his purpose? Um, and at the same time, are there any other tips you have to help um, some of the guys in the MOA community remain relevant or build their relevancy? Yeah, re- relevance is a is is what we all strive for every athlete when when he's done you want to you want to remain relevant you want you want your name to still hold its weight you want to you you want to make sure that um that rooms you walk in and things that you do uh people want to be around you and be with you Uh, so relevance is everything and 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 one of the things is that that I believe in order to stay relevant, you have to continue to reinvent yourself. You have to learn more things and do more things. Not only you know I, I minored in oral communication, but hiring not just not just taking up public speaking, but hiring a voice coach, a speaking coach to teach me how to breathe and speak. Um, I work with I work with Rich Ivan with Rich Eisen. I learn how to read the teleprompter. I learn how to host events. Um, making sure that the more that you can do means the more opportunities you're going to have to do things and to maintain your relevance. You have to, you, you can't just be a one trick pony. Hey, I play football and that's it. No, I can do more than just play football. I'm capable of, of, of doing a lot of different things, speaking on a lot of different topics, continuing to read up on how to develop personally. Um, how do you get better? Uh, how do you maintain your nutrition, a good nutrition, um, you just want to continue to add things into your toolbox. Did you uh did you coach Rich Eisen on the 40 yard dash? No. <laughs> <laughs> did no. you by the way, did, did you see he got a card in Madden this year? 
They gave, oh, finally they? Oh, they gave him a card. And it's him with his hand down and his tie is like hanging out like this where he's running the floor. What did he run it in? Like a five, was it a five, nine or a six, or six something? He's, he's been trying to break a, a five flat. He's been trying to break five. Flat. He's been trying to break five, five. Yeah. It's been tough for him though. <laughs> Gosh, man. Love when, Rich, you, man. When, when you're there and you're watching that or is everybody just like huddled around just can't wait to see what he does i'm gonna be honest with you man because he puts a lot of he worked he works at it he's he's like training so i i, I want to see him do it i've been i've been i've been wanting to see him do it you know if, if he cracked if he four nine nine like good that'd be incredible been, I, i'm i'm cheering for him like the suspense is building amazing awesome uh sean whalen uh, sean what's your question brother Sean, sorry, go ahead and unmute yourself. There we go. Hey, uh, sorry if you covered this already because I had to take a call for part of this. Um, but you mentioned downside protection, which is a topic that I love having with my business owner clients as well. Can you talk a bit, uh, you know, without getting too nerdy about it, what that looks like? Because, you know, most advisors are only doing stocks, bonds, and even then they're only doing index funds and ETFs and all of that doesn't hedge against uh, entrepreneurial risk. Yeah, so um, most most of the index funds, is, is what we're talking about in, in the space of um, whether it's uh, indexed, uh, fixed, fixed index annuities, um, uh, figuring out how to use your, uh, your, your, your life insurance policies. Uh, all of these things have these index funds to where you have, you have zero, zero risk. Um, they're, they're downside projected. Um, they, they grow, your money grow. Uh, obviously on the insurance side, there's, um, you have the, the tax-free implications, but um what you want to make sure you do is uh, not just try to get into it yourself. You, you get somebody that's that's professional in it. Uh, you know, somebody like Hannah that's been doing it for for twenty five years because it's all about the structure of it. But but yeah, index funds. If you're gonna if you're gonna be active on one side and you're taking risk, you, I say have both. I I don't think one side is better than the other. I think diversifying your portfolio and make sure that you have some risk. Make sure you that you can assume that risk, but also on the on the other side understanding what a lot of these index funds are doing, the way that some of these, some of these fixed index annuities, uh, the returns that they're giving you, it's stupid. And and then the compounding interest that go with that as well. It protects you when the market's not doing well. Hannah, okay, can so, you, go ahead, go ahead, Sean. Uh, oh, uh, so fixed index annuities specifically, as opposed to index funds, which tend to be, uh, which are risk on asset realistically. And if anything, exactly. yep. yeah, there's, there's a, there's a difference. They sound the same, but they're different. Okay. And then uh, you're set up through uh, WFG, which is, uh, they're like an offshoot of Primerica at some point, or can you- Somewhat, somewhat. Yeah. They operate They operate in the same space, except that we're not a captive company. We have access to, to you know, other people's products and services, and we don't own any product in a sense. So we're not pushing anything. We don't have to push anything. We literally go out and we see what's best in the market for our clients, and we put them in whatever, whatever is best for them, we put them in. All right. Thanks. Awesome. Hey, Hannah, can you explain something to me? Because we had a discussion about this previously. So if I invest in an index fund, so for, for the, you guys, just let's just say we have a, an average rate of return. Let's say we get, you know, inflation's around 3%. And let's just say I make 7 8 9% on a regular basis. You mentioned before for the annuities that you guys sell that there's a cap to the upside, but it will keep your, your previous high watermark. How does that work? Like for instance, and what I'm saying is it from like, from the, from the actual annuity seller how how am i able to maintain protection for my clients downside financially how does that work yeah great question so basically whether you're using an annuity contract or using a life insurance contract and that just really comes down to like are you um rolling over a lump sum of money which is when we usually use an annuity and a life insurance contract is when they want it to be more liquid but what happens is that we're using different index strategies. So every carrier, this is why it's important, like Marshall said, to work with someone with experience. And that's not limited to one carrier because every client is going to be, you know, a little bit different. So we have hundreds of different index strategies. Some of them are going to go like one year point to point. Some of them go two year point to point. Some can go five years point to point. So what happens during that time is that they're going to measure whatever index they're using. So let's just say they're using the S&P, which everyone kind of understands the S&P. So if they're using the S&P year to year, what happens is that they're going to measure their returns, usually minus dividends, 
and then they're going to credit your account. So you're not actually in the market. So you're not actually seeing your money go up and down. So at the end of that point to point, at the end of the year, they're going to credit your account and now you're locked in. So if the market goes down the following year, you're not going down with, with, with the market. So again, what would happen in that year is you would just be flat. If there was a negative year or a zero year, you would just have a flat year. The following year, again, the market goes up, then you're going to take that ride up. They're going to lock you in again. And so this is what happens. And so the interest is compounding on top of each other and you're never seeing a downside. And that's the big deal. And again, most people have no clue how these things work and they've only heard things about how they work. But what I found is when you deep dive these products, you know, one of the first questions people ask is, it sounds too good to be true. How come I've never seen it before? And then they want in because they're just, they're just that good. And again, it's the opposite side from what, you know, what you're doing with the high risk and, you know, speculative investments. This is the, like, what part of your portfolio do you want to guarantee? You know, God forbid we have the market, you know, drops again. How much of your portfolio do you want to see absolutely no losses in? That's, that's what we're playing with here. Does anybody have any questions when it comes to that? Uh, guys, make sure, go down to the bottom. It's going to say reaction. Some of you guys are writing questions in the chat. I need you guys to go down to the bottom where it says reaction and then click raise hand. So one thing I'm going to bring up, um, I'm the only person who does this. Nobody, because we're live on YouTube. Nobody else is going to go live on YouTube with strangers because this is a quick way to lose your channel, which is why <laughs> all of you guys are muted. And uh, except for except for co-hosts, all you guys are muted. Before you guys came on, you should have seen, we already had people like spamming curse words in the chat and all this kind of stuff. So that's one of the issues, but I don't want to just do super chats. I want you guys to ask your questions face-to-face, face-to-face interactions on Zoom. This is the future. This is how you're going to do your job interviews. Who knows? This is how you're going to maybe do your first date in 50 years. Who knows how it works? You need to get good at this with good lighting, facing the camera, asking questions, making sure there's spaces in between your words so that you sound normal, presenting yourself in a normal manner. And that's something we want to coach here. So we're going to go, we have Dawson. Dawson, what's your question? And Dawson, my bad. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Dawson. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Marshall, for being on the show today. Uh, my question was, what was it like being 5'10 in a field full of six foot plus players? Um, Dawson, I didn't know I was 5'10. I uh, felt like I was seven feet tall. Uh, okay. Did I play like that? Mm-hmm. Okay. It, it took me a long time to get my growth spurt. <laughs> yeah, I, I never, Dawson, I never really, I never really looked that height. Like literally. And f- football is a game that, you know, size really doesn't matter. You can, there, there's ways to get it done. Doesn't matter what size you are. When you look at the running backs that's in the Hall of Fame, you're going to see guys that was 180 pounds to guys that were, 260 pounds. So there's a there's a bunch of ways to get the job done. It is not one size fits all. It's not. Thank you. Awesome. And I think, you know, it's a great question because one of the things that happens often, Marshall, is like, you know, I do performance coaching and a lot of times the guys are like, well, this girl isn't going to like me because I'm 5'9 or I'm 5'8 or something like that. And I just always bring up the points where guys overcome or just don't even, in the way they overcome is they don't even notice it. They don't care. And if you don't care, they're not going to care either. Yeah. I, I like I, I, People looked at me like I was seven feet when I walked on the football field. For sure. For sure. All right, man. The host of the It's Just Banter podcast, Mr. T.C. Fleming from Dallas, Texas. T.C., what's going on, man? Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, Marshall, with the way that your career played out in college, where you know it seemed like uh, within a couple games of your uh, first arriving at San Diego State, it was apparent that the big schools had made a mistake not recruiting you as a running back. I was just wondering how you think things would play out if you had played now with the transfer rules and NIL being where they are. If Alabama comes and offers you $2 million, are, are you turning that down? What, what, what's your reaction? Uh, that's a good question, man. Um, you know, based on where my family was at the time, I would have had to take the money when I got – you know, I was I was a poor little kid from the from New Orleans. Grew up in Desire Projects. Um, two million to me at 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 nineteen. I'm out. I'm yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like if, if that's the only way you can get me in the state of Alabama. <laughs> Fair enough. Awesome, man. Any other questions, TC? 
Uh, if you're gonna give me the chance, sure. Um, yeah. How you, you're talking some about this, you know, with the uh, the public speaking and stuff like that, but just internally, how did how did your relationship with yourself change when you stopped playing? I, that just seems like such a challenge in someone's life. Uh, you know, that you define yourself as this football player, and now all that's gone. Was that was that hard? Was that a big challenge? Like, you know, I just, how did how did you handle that? Um, how do I handle it every day is I'm still handling it every day. I look in the mirror and I meet myself. Hi, Marshall Falk. Nice to meet you. Like I, I'm, I'm Marshall Falk. I'm not just a football player. And I remind myself of that. And I continue to do things to, to, to challenge myself to see, um, how do I get better? How can I get better? Um, where can I get better? What can I do to, to push myself to see what kind of person is really inside the things that that made me great at football can those things make me great at life and if they don't what else do i have to acquire what skill set i need to, to 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 attain i'm just trying to get better just like each and every one of you and then uh last one um was mike martz pretty legendarily kind of a weird guy while also being a genius what was what was your experience with him did, did you like mike did you ever had any, any weird moments you know what, man? I've never met a person who was cool and a genius. Normally when you're a genius, you're weird. <laughs> you're like, people look at you like you're crazy. And a lot of the things that we did in football, guess what people said? You can't do that. And now everybody's doing it. It was, you know, it was unheard of. But now it's the, it's, it's the, it's the status. You know, it's like, it, when I came into the league, think about this, this was football. When I came into the NFL in the early 90s, if your quarterback threw the ball, more than 25 times you were losing and you probably got him hurt. Okay. In today's league, if your quarterback isn't throwing the ball 25 times, you're losing <laughs> or your quarterback's hurt. Yeah. That's the Incredible. game's just changed. Change. Yeah. yeah. When, when Thanks, you, man. I'm, I'm just curious, uh, Marshall, when you, when you first saw, when you first got um, exposed to what Mike Martz was trying to do there, what did you see that was so genius? What was the thing that he was doing that was so outside the box? Um, it, it, it wasn't that he it wasn't that he did anything in particular. Here's what he said to me. Look, this was our meeting. I said, Mike, show me your offense. He said, I'm not going to show you the whole offense, but here's what I need you to see. I need you to see this. All right. And he said, he drew he drew up the play. He said, now, if I hand you the ball and you run through the line of scrimmage, all right, you have a chance of getting tackled by these four guys. And these four guys is usually the guys that hurt people. Okay? He said, now, if I drop back and I let you go through the line of scrimmage and you turn around three to four yards and I throw you the ball, is there any difference between that? I was like... He said, wait, if you line up behind a quarterback and I throw you a toss, sweep, okay? Think about all the guys that's coming for you. What if I let you run out there and I have the quarterback throw you the ball and now it's just you and one guy one-on-one? -on -one? Is it any different? I was like, no. He said, so I want you to look at playing in this offense and what I'm going to do with you, it can't be about carries. It can't be about catches. It has to be about touches. You're going to touch the ball anywhere from 25 to 30 times a game in this offense. I just need you to not care how you touch it. Wow. And that awesome. right there, that changed it all. Incredible. Incredible. Awesome. Uh, Dennison, what's going on, man? Hey, hey, what's going on, gentlemen? Good evening. Oh, gentlemen. What's up? What's up? Uh, so... <laughs> I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, first, um, uh, first of all, a pleasure to meet you. This is awesome. Thank you. Thank you for setting, up, setting this up, Mike. So uh, I've, I was thinking about your financial literacy uh, company. Um, and I was, uh, I'm, I'm a school teacher. I'm, I'm really passionate about that, that and teaching younger populations. So I wanted to, uh, first I wanted to ask, like, how did you, how did you create a business up around that to then, offer the value to people because it seems like this it's a little bit of intangible but 
how do you package it to to give? And do you have any suggestions for me to um, to focus on a younger population? Well, um, first of all, uh, uh, let, let me share this with you. Um, our curriculum in this space is built off like fourth grade education. We we use cartoon characters and stuff like that because we understand that's that's the easy way to learn. And so we're teaching adults with with fourth grade material that you can use with kids that that's that young. We're talking about simple interests, compound interests, um, basic stuff, how to save a uh, credit score. We're, we're teaching them at a young age the things that that we found out when we were adults. When we, like we're showing them how to do those things. We want them to understand um, what what's what's the difference. What 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 is what is cryptocurrency? Like what is that? You know, some of us on here is still baffled by what what crypto really is. Uh, so we use um, a very young, uh, let's say, methodology. I should say an old school methodology that young kids use right now. That that's what we use. It's not anything that's savant like. We're, we're we're not doing that. We're we're really using. If if you if you look up how money works. And look up the people who created it, because I don't want you to think that we we created it. We've made a business out of it. We didn't create it. How many works? Um, the people who who wrote it, the literature, the curriculum, that stuff, easy to get, easy to get, real 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 basic, so, so real basic stuff. A, so you formed a curriculum around resources that you you thought were just easy, easily accessible. That's it. Think things that yeah. that's easily easily accessible. That we're not provided. It's not in. It's not in schools. Mm -hmm. Like most yeah, schools definitely. are not teaching financial literacy. They're not. Yeah. So, uh, have you ever heard of? Uh, let's see. What are their names? There. There's a podcast called Earn Your Leisure. Have you ever heard about? Yeah. That? Yeah. They do a great job. Okay. Do a great job. Have you Have you been to Invest Fest before? No, I have not. I have not. But okay. But they do. They do a great job at um, yeah. at providing information and resources to to a lot of underserved population. Right on, right on. All right, cool. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dennison, right. you. Dennison, you're in high school education right now. Is that right? Yeah, middle school to high school. Okay. And you and you you you're what you're saying is you haven't seen like they're not teaching anything about financial literacy at all at that age. No, no. Right. The trend has been recently actually for government funding to to support nonprofits that do it or or programs that do it. So uh. There's a there's I just want to make sure I can figure that connection because the money's out there, the resources, the intent is out there. I think it's sure. just in the um in the in the sphere. I love yeah, it. We, man. we do it for free. We give it away. That's part of okay. Part uh, of what we where do. can I where can I find more information? Is there a website I can go to right now? Yeah. Um I'll I'll make sure. Actually, I got you. Thank yeah. you. Also, uh, Kayla and Hannah, if you guys want to give me all your links, I'm going to put them in the description in the show notes for this episode on YouTube, guys. So just give me any links, and then I'll and I'll go ahead and put those. I'll put those in there immediately. Uh, Gabe, awesome, absolutely, for sure. Gabe, what's your uh, what's your question, Gabe? Gabe, sorry, go ahead and unmute yourself. Gabe, sorry, it looks like your your microphone isn't working. If you're on Bluetooth, a lot of times it won't it won't work. No, still not. Hey, Gabe, try it again, and then test your. You can test your microphone on Zoom. Test your mic before you come on, and then we'll have you on here in a second. Will, what's going on, Will? And unmute yourself, Will. What's going on? Uh, thank you for coming on board here. Um, I have a question regarding athleticism. So. For you, you've performed at the highest of levels, and um, I feel like uh, obviously athletes uh, are seen as attractive in the dating world. And so, I'm wondering if you have any tips for someone who you know doesn't necessarily uh, market themselves naturally as athletic. Like I'm, I'm usually middle of the pack. Like I did soccer, cross country, but never got to that level. But uh, I always had the discipline, like I go to the gym almost every day, but typically I don't strike the uh, impression of coming across athletic. So wondering if you had any tips around that. Um, 
outside of getting in the gym and doing what you got to do and make sure, make sure, Will, that you look the way you want to look for you first. That That's everything. Um, but I think the most important part is uh, understanding that the physical, that, that, that's probably how you're going to get them. But the mental, what's in your head and what's in your heart is how you're going to keep them. So mm. s- spend a lot of time on that, man. Spend a lot of time on that. Like develop, develop uh, mentally, develop emotionally, so so you can provide whomever your partner is uh, whatever they need in order to to be in that space with you and to be in a healthy space with you. Uh, the physical part, it, it, it's a lot. It's an attraction. I, I think it's the it's the it's the bait. You know, it's it's the bait, but you can't keep them with the physical because we're we're all going to get old at some point in time. <laughs> and and you got to have those other things in place. Awesome, That's a good point. Thank you. Beautiful. Awesome. Uh for all the way from New York City, Mr. Raj Singh. Raj, what's going on, brother? And unmute yourself. What's up? What's up? How's it going, Mike and uh Marshall and Kayla? It's awesome. Not not every not every day you can get to talk to an NFL Hall of Famer. So I just had to I had to say something. <laughs> but um you know, uh, I actually also work in, uh, you know, financial services and, and, and wealth management specifically. So, you know, me, I'm still pretty early on in my career. And I guess um, the more people I meet, the more I the more I realize that things I don't know. Right. So I guess my question when it comes to learning and, you know, just being an open book, do you guys have any maybe book recommendations that uh, you recommend anybody could read that uh, really helped you guys in your journey in learning? And specifically with finances, with the uh, you know career stuff and stuff like that. You know what? That that's a good question for Hannah. I mean, she's she's been around forever. She's twenty five years in the business. I don't know if she's she's still here. She she might might yep. be here, but there she is. She's yep. always recommending books, and the lady reads reads more than anybody. And I know. Just Hannah, uh, do you have any book a wealth of knowledge? Do you have any book recommendations, Hannah? Yeah, one that I like a lot. Um, it's called the Laser Fund. Uh, by Doug Andrews. It's it's fantastic. And it really explains the life insurance co- um, concept that most people, they just, when, when they think of life insurance, they think of death insurance. And I think Doug Andrews does a great job at really showing you how you could use it as an investment tool. It's actually one of his favorite investment tools. He uses it, he uses it for almost everything. So that's a really good one. Um, there's another good one called the New Life Insurance Investment Advisor. That was written probably 25 years ago, but you know it's also just a great, great read. Um, I think I think those are probably the best two. There's also I think the the financial pocket knife is uh, is what it's called. Um, again, just a great, great, great read. And uh, I actually got one more: uh, tax free retirement by uh, Patrick Kelly. Beautiful, beautiful. I will definitely take a take a look at all, all those uh, all those books and hopefully. If you if you guys do get a chance to come back, hopefully we can talk more about it. And and can I ask a second question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, uh, Marshall. So obviously, you know, people look up to you're an NFL running back, like, and you just had an amazing career. Do you have any favorite players in the NFL right now that remind me remind you of yourself or just somebody's game that you just like? Um, you know, I would say between. Uh, Elvin Kamara, um, Nick Chud, um, Stingletary, uh, Saquon Barkley, um, Kristen McCaffrey, all, all the guys that that's playing three downs. You know, they they can run the ball inside, outside, and catch the ball out of the backfield, and stay in when it's time to pass protect. Like those guys, that's that, that you know they they have the mentality of, you know, I can do it all. I want to be resourceful for my team. Those mm-hmm. are the guys that. When I when I look at them, I like how they play the game. Right, right, and it's, it's funny that you mentioned Barkley because I'm a Giants fan. Now we we lost into our division rivals. So yeah, nice, <laughs> nice, 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 nice going to come help beat up on y'all. <laughs> I know it's just it's horrible. We always lose to the Eagles, but uh, appreciate appreciate everything, guys. Um, thank you. Nice, right nice, Gabe. Let's try this again, Gabe. Can you can you uh, unmute yourself? Give it a shot, Gabe. Go ahead and talk. No, Gabe, it looks like there's something wrong with your microphone. So go back into the thing and test your mic because we're not getting any audio from you at all. Sorry about that, man. NDMR, 
What's your what's your question, brother? And go ahead and unmute yourself. You gotta unmute yourself, Andy. There you go. Hey Marshall. Uh sorry, hey guys. Uh my question is for Marshall. Um, you know, uh when you uh dealing with us uh with all this stuff, uh what uh when you were pushed out of your games, uh what routines uh, like you were talking about mentally, you know, improvement, like uh what uh exercises or what type of routines did do you recommend or should practice to become who you became? Um, so I'm a I'm I'm a I'm a huge believer in um in having mentors. Um obviously I I've been um I've I've sat in therapy pretty much my whole adult life. Uh, dealing with, um, you know, you come from nothing, you have all this money, uh, you feel like, you know, are you worthy of it? Um, like, why didn't other people have this? You, you start to feel this yeah. guilt and um, just making sure you surround yourself with the right group of people, the right teams, that you're talking with the right people, um, you know, and 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 you got to change some things around you. Um, you know, it's like you you, you can't, you can't, you can't grow and be the person you want to be with people who don't who don't want to grow with you or see you grow into what what those things are you want to be. But definitely, man, there's 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 mentors. You, you got to have some mentors. If you you don't have mentors, you're trying to take this thing on by yourself. Good luck. <laughs> you <gotta laughs> <have some. laughs> okay. And how do you reach mentors? Like, uh, like uh, by yourself? Like, how did you? did uh yourself uh to find these type of mentors like in the um, day when you started? I, I, I reached out to them and i said listen I, I i love the way that you did x y and z and how you did x y and z um i want to do some things like that what do i have to do for you to mentor me and they'll tell you here's what i need you to do these are the rules to me mentoring you here's how you have to show up and it starts, it starts there, like right there. You literally start to improve yourself based on the things that they ask you to do. Okay. All Sound right, good? perfect, man. I appreciate Yeah. Hey, no, appreciate Thanks you, so man. Much. I'll do this, no, Chris. Thank you. Uh, thank you, brother. Chris, what's your question? And Chris, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Nice to talk to you, Marshall. I'm from Nigeria, so we don't watch American football, but nice to hear the stories. The question I have is, given everything you know now, are there any questions or heuristics you would use when finding a good financial advisor? Is there any um, question you can ask that can tell who are the good from the bad? Yes. Uh, there's there's two things that's that's important to me because right now – Right now, all financial advisors are using the same. They're they're using AI. Like they're not making any decisions. They're not they're not pulling your putting your money into stuff and pulling your money out of stuff. It's all relationship based. So nobody's really doing it the way it used to be done when you needed to have a good one. Um, these bots now are making all the decisions. So it's all based on relationship. You know, it's like you want to tr be able to trust the person who has your money. You want to be able to go to dinner with the person who has your money. You you want to you want to make sure that the person who's handling your money is is someone that um, that you respect and that respects you and that they're treating it not like it's their money but that is your money and that they respect who you are and what you want to do what you want to do with you and your family and how important that money is to you and your family. It's all relationship based for me. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Awesome, man. Uh, one more time in Australia, Ryan. Go ahead, and you're unmuted. There you go. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah. Yes, this is actually a question for all the guests, um, Marshall, Hannah, and Kayla, and um, probably also you, Michael. So my question comes from something personal <laughs> I'm, I've sort of been struggling with. Um, you hear the words stay humble thrown around in high performance by high performance athletes, high performance business owners who've excelled, um, excelled um, and achieved excellence. 
Um, you're all in high performance spaces, right? High performance jobs, businesses, etc. Um, but you kind of have to be in a space where you believe you're the shit. You're really good at what you do, but at the same time, you're willing to learn and improve. So where's where's the middle ground there? Um, you know, how do you find the middle ground? So, for example, if you had a kid, how would you teach them how to approach being humble? Yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll start, and, and I'll say yeah. this, um, Ryan. For me, um, you know, I understand that humility and remaining humble is always being where your feet is. You know, that's where I'm at. I'm always there. I'm not wishing I was somewhere else. I'm not wishing I could be doing something else. I'm 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 exactly in that space. And um, you know, I make sure that the person that I'm talking to know that that I value their time and I want them to value mine. And and um what was the second part of your question? Yeah, so if if um and again, so Marshall, this is something I'm personally struggling with is um right. You you kind of got to have the confidence to know that you oh, kick that's ass what it was. and that's what and it was. you're better than else. But yeah, how, what would you tell your kids? Like, what would you tell your kids to find that balance point between knowing you can do it and kick ass, and then also, you know, showing humility. Yeah, yeah, and 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 for that, there's there's no there's no balance in that. You know, you just understand that you're not gonna <clears throat> you're not gonna always kick ass, and. When I'm talking to people, I'm, I'm I'm in one or two spaces and I make sure I'm always in one or two spaces. I'm either teaching somebody something or I'm learning something. And and that's it. And I'm I'm I can never grow to a point to where I can't learn. I'm I'm always I'm thirsty for knowledge, I'm thirsty for information. Um I'm taking everything in and I'm retaining the things that I feel are valid and the things that can help me grow. And I'm letting other stuff go. But you have to understand that um when you kick an ass, you kick an ass. And when you're not, you're not. Um, you just got to make sure when you when you kick an ass and you high, that you remember there's going to be a time that you're not. So remember when you kick an ass, how you treat people. Because as you come down, you might see those people on their way up. Hey Ryan, awesome. I, thank I, you, Marshall. Ryan, I think I think it comes to uh, the idea of preparation. So, like, it, there's it's not arrogant if you can do it, right? So, for instance, if it's something where you know I put in thousands of hours of into um, uh, what's it called? If I put thousands of hours into public speaking and then I go do pu some public speaking and I expect to do well, you are hear uh, Dave Chappelle when he talks about every time I go on stage, I just kill it every time. Ever since I was a little kid. If you put thousands of hours into something and you have a lot of preparation and then you go into it, that's not arrogant. In fact, if you're an operator in the US military, if you're a pilot or if you're a tank driver or if you're a trigger puller, if you're a infantry or whatever, you do lots of reps and sets so that you get to a point to where you know it's second nature to you. And it's not bragging at that point when you when you do the thing that you're supposed to do that you've been preparing to do. I had a, a, a my instructor when I upgraded to instructor from in when I was in the uh, uh, navigator instructor in the Air Force, he told me, he goes, dude, you're going to feel a lot better in the airplane when you're just more knowledgeable. He said the best way to get over nausea is GK, general knowledge. And so that's the thing. I think it's preparation rather than just this delusional feeling of grandeur that you're just better than people because that right there, when you just think you're better than other people, the learning stops. You mm -hmm. won't listen to your mentors anymore. And you don't ever want the learning to stop. I'm always in, in MOA. What am I always doing? Every week I'm recommending another book for you guys because the learning continues. I'm not, I'm just a signpost. There's other people that we can learn from that are much smarter than us. And we always need to be learning from them. Make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Beautiful quick answers, guys. Thank you for that. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, let's go to DJ Rez. DJ Rez, what's up, man? What's your question? And unmute yourself, brother. Go ahead. Hey, Mike. Uh, hey, Marshall. Um, I just had a question about, I mean, since a lot of us are um, on here to get better with uh, our dating lives, I'll, back when, I'm not sure if you're single right now or not. Uh, I don't think you are. But oh, assuming you were single... <laughs> What is it like being an NFL, uh, all you know, a star in the NFL, 
and 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 tell us about dating and how how it works very quickly. <laughs> it's fun when you're in NFL and you're and you're single. Dating is fun. Now okay. the bad part about dating is most of the time when you go out with a girl, they don't know how much you make, how much you're worth. When you're in the NFL, they know. So you you. you is there any cons to that? The, the the only con the only con is you conning yourself that it doesn't matter. You got to understand it's 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 just it's an attraction. As you may be attracted to a blonde or a brunette, some people are attracted to money. Now you just got to make sure that that's not the only reason why she's with you. Um, but when you're when you're when you are um in your early 20s man and you're 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 living in life you're living in life and then but you got to understand that 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 life ends and and where does the life begin that you want to live for the rest of your life beautiful beautiful hey kayla actually i wanted to ask you cuz you're an influencer the whole humility thing one of the things that i found is that this is something i mentioned i don't know if you've heard me talk about this before but you know so i host the, these huge pageants here and I host several different events, and it always seems like it is. It it always seems like it is the prettiest girls who. Hold on a second, guys. We're getting a little muting issue here. Go ahead. Uh, it always seems like it's the prettiest girls who are the most professional, right? Uh, I end up having like uh, I was talking with this about uh, with Chloe Teray. She's like always on time. She the photographers love to shoot with her, but there's a level of humility because right these these women are being asked to do all these this photography, um, and they're being paid to do it. So. Some of them come off as arrogant, but when you're humble, those are the ones who end up getting the most work. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like it really depends from person to person, you know, what your life story is and what you've been through and really what your intention is behind everything that you're doing in life. And I think, you know, for me, thankfully, I was I was raised right and I've got great parents that have shown me the way uh, to humility really being the way the best way to go about things and i've and no one's ever really going to work want to work with you or bring you back or invite you places if you're arrogant and it's the same thing for for the men out there that are dating there's you can tell immediately someone's the the difference of intention between somebody with ego and somebody with humility that wants to keep learning and growing and challenging mm. themselves and there is nothing sexier in this world than somebody that is intelligent and brave and secure, but also humble enough to still seek knowledge and know that you're never going to know everything there is to know. And there's always more information and knowledge out there. And for me personally, when I've been out and been introduced to some of these models that just have a big head, it doesn't make me want to hang out with them or be around them, you know? Yeah. So I think uh, it's it's done me well. It's done me a service to to be humble and yeah. and kind to people. That's just something I've noticed, Kayla, is that as I go up the ladder further, I notice that those girls tend to be way more professional and easier to work with. It's the opposite of what you think. It's the girl with the, like 2,000 follower, followers from Des Moines, Iowa, who's like, can you fly <laughs> me out? I'm like, for what? The fuck am I going to fly you out for? We didn't. Caitlin Runk and Kindly Myers are doing this for free. And you want us to fly you out? Are you out of your, But I don't right. say that. I don't say that. I'm not stupid. I'm not going to say that. But that's like how I feel. It's just so crazy that it works like that. And then, and then to, you know, the other analogy would be like a situation like Antonio Brown or Metal World Peace or Dennis Rodman or someone like that who's magnificently talented, but difficult to work with and difficult yeah. to coach. And it becomes it, where a lot of people just don't want to touch them after a while. Um, you know, you can think of numerous instances in, in the NFL where that happened, uh, where, you know, a lot, a lot of times with athletes, it's like, does your talent overcome the drama that you bring? And then as a mm -hmm. model, does your professionalism and your looks overcome the drama that you bring? And the best thing is just don't bring any drama. Just don't. Why are you going to yep. do that to yourself? You're shooting yourself in the foot. But More I think, fun to win I Super think Bowl. a lot of people have to learn the hard way, though. They have to fall down and learn the hard way and embarrass themselves. And hopefully they have some... <laughs> some humility to be yeah. a little bit embarrassed and learn the hard way and then get back up and be like, okay, I'm not going to do it that way. Again, I've, I've learned my lesson. Actually, you know, this is a funny question. Marshall, have you noticed the, the guys on the outside, like, like when you think of Terrell Owens or Cortland Finnegan or like 
the guys who played wide receiver or corner, they seem to have a different personality than everyone else. Michael Irvin, like, is it a function where you know you're going to get hit that hard? And so you have to have a delusional level of belief in yourself in order to be like that? Because I don't see running back, like Derrick Henry seems like really quiet to me. What do, is this something you notice that the guys on the outside, they seem to talk the most? Is it, is it the speed thing? Is it the, the fact that you're going to get popped going 30 miles an hour? Like, what is it? Before I say this, I have to, I, before I say what I'm about to say, I have to preface the statement with this. I play with Isaac Bruce, Dory Hope, Isaac King, Ricky Pro, um, Marvin Harrison. None of them were like that were like that. All right. Mm. None of them. None of them. You never heard any issues of they just they were not yeah. like that. Now, my analogy for the receiver position and why is because so much has to happen. For them to have success. Yeah. And and their, their thought process when you're out there is you have to kind of like a boxer. You can't step in the ring thinking you're going to lose. You have to think you're the best of the best of the best there ever was. I don't care who you are if you want to be successful playing receiver. And that's 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 their mindset. And their mindset is, I don't care what happens. If they throw me the ball, we will win. That's all they know. Yeah. That's all they know. Yeah, you think about that whole episode where Terrell Owens was like, you know, yelling on the sidelines for San Francisco. A lot of, you remember that whole thing happens. A lot of p people don't remember what happened the next game. They threw him the ball 15 times and they won. You know, it, the truth was Jeff Garcia did need to get him the ball more, you know? So it is one of these interesting things. They, um... If a receiver, so let's say all the guys that I mentioned before I started talking about, they all they all thought like that. They just didn't externally show you that. Yeah, they they kept it inside, or 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 Isaac or Tory or or even Marvin. They say, "Man, it, you better start throwing me the damn ball." Like yeah. they, they would say it, but it would never get outside of the locker room. It, the, and that's, it was a that's the difference. There was always this this interesting ritual, and I don't know if he did it when you were there, but Marvin Harrison would, after he'd scored touchdown, go to the end of the bench and then talk to no one. Is that something that was throughout his whole career? He looked angry, and he wasn't angry. No, that that was just who he was. Like the, the, there was times when I used to look at Marvin and and wonder, is football fun for you? Like, are you having fun? <laughs> it just didn't look like it was fun yeah. for him. Yeah, same 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 thing. I don't know if you saw the Barry Sanders. Um, Oh yeah, yeah. It's the same I know kind of Barry. Thing. I yeah. know Barry. Like it, 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 Barry's just a different. He's just a different dude, man. Just like Barry, it, it, one of my guys, man. I love that dude. Love him. Yeah. He's just, he's just. But once you, once you get to really see Barry and know Barry, then you'll hear the jokes and he's funny. Like his his personality and his sense of humor. It's it's unbelievable. But yeah, just on 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 the surface, just looks seems like a weird dude. Like we're due. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, man. Let's keep it going here. Uh, AJ Steele, what's going on, brother? AJ, AJ, which, uh, which part of Mexico or Colombia or Brazil are you in right now? Right, right now I'm in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Okay, nice. All right, AJ, what's your question? Uh, I had two questions. First one was, have you met your girl's parents? What are you talking about me? Yeah. Yes, I met my, my my girlfriend's parents, all three of them. Yeah, she she's yeah. So um, I'm kind of in like a similar situation. I'm talking to this girl who uh -huh. I'm pretty serious about, and she's about 15 years younger than me. Okay. There sometimes is depending on the parents. Obviously, it's different. Um, like that preconceived ideas that the parents have, like oh, this guy's a lot older than my baby, my daughter. Yeah. Um, any. I don't know. What's the... Okay, let me help you with this because this is something I've had yeah. to deal with as well, okay? The the trick is you need to make it make sense. Does that make sense? You're the, like, yeah. it just say, same kind of situation, right? When Marshall was sitting there talking about a financial advisor, are they looking out for you? Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But in the situation, your parents are. There's a, If parents weren't looking out for kids, there wouldn't be 8 billion people on the planet. It's an evolutionary adaptation, right? So the thing you have to add, you have to, when I, when I met uh, Kylie's mother, father, and stepfather, uh, his stepfather or her stepfather is a, is a U.S. Marshal. And instead of whereas a lot of guys would be like intimidated by that, I was 
you know, I, I read all the Raylan Givens novels. I read Justified, and I I was like, I, I had tons of stuff to talk to them about. But I needed to for to I needed it to make sense to them why I love their daughter, why it worked out between us, what I saw for the future, right? And then they ne also needed to understand. Did I have a stable way of making money that was going to go for a long time so that I could, you know, provide for their daughter? It, once I made it made sense, I think that's what made things a lot easier. Yeah, I feel like like any parent's just main thing like is is this guy just trying to mess with my daughter or yeah. are you courting her for marriage or whatever, some kind of seriousness? And, 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 and the, the thing is, AJ, it's usually the the mom, because as men, we kind of know, you'll meet a woman and she's fine and you're like, are you going to marry her? And you're like, I don't fucking know. Maybe I don't, I can marry her. I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like you, you just don't know. But a lot of times for women, they'll come into it and they're like, I know I'm 32 and must get married now. And there's a plan. And is you have to follow the plan. And if you don't follow... But for us as dudes, it's like, she's awesome. She's awesome. She's awesome. She's awesome. Wait a second. This one, I don't want her to leave. And then all of a sudden, you know, the it, it, but you don't know in the beginning, but your parent, but the parents, a lot of times they want you to know. And sometimes you don't even know. And so that makes things kind of difficult. And there's always going to be this push pull. It's difficult. But the thing that I found is when there, when Kylie's parents understood what I did and understood how I made money and understood what our day-to-day -day life was like, once I made it made sense, then there was no issue. Yeah, like, you know, what is your intention with my daughter kind of thing? I have sure. it like worked out in my head because I know the protective instincts of parents and whatnot because yeah. I could just put myself in their shoes. Um, so that helps with what you said. Uh, second question. But well, hold on, hold on. Before, this... before we go on, before we go on, Marshall, you've got six kids. Can you talk about how you've had to deal with it? I'm sure you have some girls and you, how you've dealt with this in, in this situation. AJ, here, here, here's what I'm going to say. The easiest thing to do is what would you need to hear from a guy that was dating your daughter for you to feel like, I, I like this guy. What would you, what would you need to hear? I thought, I thought the same thing. Yeah, I thought the same thing that I genuinely care about your daughter and I I like her a lot and uh, that you know got to be more um, than that. Yeah, I I mean right on the spot I I can't like flip it off the top of my head, but yeah, it's basically that. Then you, I'm you not can't dating flip it off the top of your head, then you don't mean it. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, I know. Um, yeah, but the, the the thing is, for the three of us, and maybe Kayla, you've gone through this too. I've been out with girls where they wanted me to meet their parents, and I didn't fucking know where it was going to go. And it was like, it sucked to be in that. And I'm not in that city. With Kylie, it was easy because I was like, I knew. It was like, no, nah, I want this girl to live with me. I'm not confused about what's going on. I just need to show them. Once they see it, everything's going to be fine. But sometimes you're like, I'm, I'm sure, you know, Marshall's in his, you know, 20s, you know, at, at NFL All Pro, and he meets a girl and she's beautiful. And she's like, I want you to meet my parents. And she's like, and he's like, I, I don't know where this is going to go. And he legitimately doesn't know. Right. So that, that's also an issue. Well, that, yeah, that's, no, that's, I, that's if, here's the issue you're you're 15 years older right yeah he got to know well i know where yeah. i want it to go but it it's i can't uh it's like he's really good like super i want to say different than girls her age she's very family oriented we we went out this weekend when i go off to do something guys are swarming on her and she's telling every guy hey get the fuck away from me i'm here with somebody I'm here with somebody like a lot of compliance, a lot of respect, and I know where I want it to go. Um, but at the same time, she's 20, you know, maybe she needs to go out and party and have fun first. I, I, I don't know, but I know they raised her real good, like ethically, morally. She seems uh, above the uh, above the rest of the bunch of a lot of girls her age who are just trying to party and live for the weekend, so to speak. I don't know exactly how to word it to her parents. Also, it's all going to be in Spanish which is also tricky because culturally they're a little different, but you know, I care a lot about his daughter and I'm not dating her for fun. Like I totally want to have children. And I believe that the girl I have fun with at parties on yachts is quite a bit different than the girl who raises my children. And I see her as more the motherly type who uh, just would be really good with kids is really, really feminine, really compliant, really all the, all these things I like that I don't find a lot where I don't, ever really want to date girls because it's hard for me to find girls like this. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about it because I know it'll probably come up in the near future. She had like some drama happen with her um, stepmom and her dad while they were just on vacation. And she called me like distraught in the middle of the night. And I flew her from that country back to where we are. 
And her mom was like super grateful that this guy did that for her and whatnot. But at the same time, I'm 15 years older than her. And it, I don't know. It's just, it's tricky. You know what I mean? That's why I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's one other thing that we're also not considering. And that is the girls who are on the yacht that are part partying every weekend that are at Miami swim week, that go to Ibiza that are in Dubai every winter. God bless them. Those girls, those girls want to get married too. Sometimes they, they want to get married too. They want to have kids. And the thing is, then they drag you into a situation where it's like, Oh, I want you to meet my family. And you're like, and you don't know how to say it. Cause you're like, but no, you're I met you at the Rhino. Like this isn't gonna. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I met you. But you're, 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 you're trying to be a good guy, but it's like this. You you knew this wasn't. We you didn't knew this wasn't going to go anywhere. Like I don't understand what's going on. You know. So that's that's also yeah. a difficult. The thing is, there seems to be this responsibility for men who make a lot of money, who are high status, is that whenever we get into a relationship, we're just supposed to know shit. We're supposed to read everyone's mind. No, sometimes we're just like living life. I got an eight figure business and people are trying to kill me. I don't fucking need to, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but like, that's what they want is they want answers. And so that's the thing, AJ, like I would say is that the parents just want to know that you have a plan and that, you know, you want what's best for her. The thing though is, and the other thing I found is like, you know, they're going to, people are going to do what they, what they're going to do. Kayla, have you ever been in a situation like this? I where mean, you yeah, wanted to know, think, or your parents wanted to know. I mean, I don't think I pressure men like that. Cause I've just, it just never really works out when you pressure people like that. I think when you know it's right, you know it's right. And you just follow things in an organic and authentic way that it unfolds naturally in that direction. But I think just in general, knowing what you want for your life, like having goals and knowing that you want kids and expressing that and being honest with people like, hey, I don't know exactly what I want from your daughter because we only just started dating and we're getting to know each other. And that's kind of the purpose of dating to begin with is to get to know if this person is right for me, but know that I do have every intention of my heart of treat treating this person good and right. And that this is what I want in my life that I do want kids that I do want to get married. And I do want to have that woman in my life. And I'm trying to figure out if your if your daughter is the person that is going to going to be that for me. No, that's that's exactly true. I guess I should uh, clip that and memorize it because it's pretty <laughs> much ver verbatim. Um, so uh, let's do uh, two two more little questions. One more for uh, for Mike and one for Marshall. Mike, um, in the same situation, uh, girl's super uh, compliant. She's really really feminine and great. How much like attention day to day should I be giving her? I feel like I always fumble it when I'm giving them like, the, oh, good morning. Good night. Yeah. How are you? So I pretty much don't do that anymore. And I've been more towards the whole uh, texts or just to set up dates and then yeah. any other thing on the uh, more intimate or questions or whatever or just towards the dates. But I'm having like, I don't know. It's like I only fumble the girls I actually like. So I'm trying mm. to like not do that this time. Yeah. So this is one of the, the interesting things. So attraction is something that you can manufacture, even if you guys aren't right for each other. You see people all the time. They're not right for each other, but there's a ton of sexual chemistry and they'll get together. Then later on, what happens is you just have a natural inclination to be very affectionate or not very affectionate. And sometimes it just doesn't match, right? Sometimes it just, uh, AJ, sometimes things just don't match. Like for instance, um, I host a bunch of bikini competitions and I host uh, all these charity celebrity events with like hundreds of women. I would need a girlfriend who's comfortable with that and doesn't find those women to be intimidating. If it doesn't work, there's no uh, like, and if it doesn't work, that doesn't mean I fumbled it. Does that make sense, AJ? Like sometimes yeah. people just aren't right for each other. Even when they're super fucking attracted to each other, it doesn't mean that it's always going to work. We see this all the time, especially in fast places like Miami or, or uh, Los Angeles or Las Vegas or New York or someplace like that. And so like, that's one of the things where I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't concern myself that much about fumbling it because you got to still be who you are. My only thing, AJ, is I'll tell you this. Are you one way with girls you don't really like that much? And then are you a different way with girls you're super attracted to? Because if you are. I, I am and I'm trying to fix it. I'm trying okay, to treat cool. them all the same. Because yeah. when, 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 back to the to the course, to the T. Yeah. When I treat them all the same, I get the same result. Compliance. Mm -hmm. They love me. Everything's amazing. When I actually like them, regardless of how hot they are or yeah. anything, when I actually like them, they get different treatment. And regardless if I hook up with them or not, or we date or not, it always goes shitty for me. It's like yeah, the you, fucking second module where yeah. you're talking or, or, and you're like, oh, they thought he was this way. And you go back with the girl and then she whips yeah. out a dick and you're like, 
it's it's like the same thing. They like think I'm this way. They think I'm this like guy and then all this stuff. And then I do something wrong and then it's like, it kills it. And then it's yeah. like almost impossible to come back from. Yeah, it is. It is crazy. So I would identify what are those things that you do that are different when it's a girl that you like. And the thing that I've done that's worked for me is, you know, I have a ton of like very beautiful female friends that I just see in a plutonic way and I never hit on them. Nothing like that. But I have my girlfriend and then me and my girlfriend, we see women together sometimes. And then there's like other women who I'm just friends with. And being around really attractive women like that and always treating them the same, that's the reason why I don't change my behavior just because she has big boobies. Does that make sense? You just can't yeah. change the inflection of your voice because she has a fat ass. If you can learn to do that, it's an incredible skill. And by the way, same thing when you're negotiating, read Pitch Anything by Orrin Clapp when he talks about the concept of like maintaining frame control and eliminating neediness. These are things are really important when it comes to pitching things and selling. And it also comes to like the highest level of intersexual dynamics. I'll put that on Makes the sense. list ASAP. Yeah, and you had a question for Marshall. I definitely. I go ahead. You had a question for Marshall. Yeah, question for Marshall would be: um, Do you have any uh, tricks or systems, or so to speak, like uh, I, for, I forget if it was like not once upon a time in America, but like Eddie Murphy, he's rich, so he fakes being broke. You know what I mean? Because a lot of these girls, it's hard to know. Okay, yeah, they're into you. They like the lifestyle you could support. And that's okay, you know what I mean? But sometimes they're more devious or tricky with it than I've I've been to Miami. I could spot gold diggers all right, but do you personally, you know, in your position have a position where you like have a little test for the girl or or something you do to really know like, oh, she's not about the money like some of these girls? Cause it, no. it, it is a problem. When you get to that point, it starts to be you can't hide it. Like the money's there, the status is there it's always a uh, in the back of your head so to speak yeah yeah i, I just accept that it's part of the attraction <laughs> you know it's, it's part of the attraction <laughs> and what i have to make sure is it's not the only thing that she's attracted to and you just you just got to make sure of that but it's it's part of the attraction it's like it's it's like do you like a girl with big boobs do you like a girl with a big ass like what it's it's like yes. that becomes success is a part of your attraction you wear it you know what I'm saying? Successful people, when you walk around, people can tell. They can yeah. tell. You could put on you could put on bummy clothes. They can tell. If uh, if I'm a famous movie star and I've won an Academy Award and there's a woman who's attracted to me for several reasons, but one of them is because I'm a movie star, that's still who I am. It's not like it's still part like he's I, I'm I'm still gonna wear that no matter what, right? So for me, I'm a coach. My, and there's a lot of times where I meet girls, uh, they'll they'll see that I have a lot of followers and they'll be like, oh, you know, they might be more attracted, but that's still who I am. It's still part of who I am. It's just like what Marshall said. It can't be the only reason. Right. Yeah. That's a good reason. No. Yeah. No, because I like them because they're hot and have a big butt. So they could like me because I'm successful and I've worked to be where I'm at. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's fine. Because you're yeah, All a right. male stripper. That's pretty good. If I think of anything else, I'll chime back in. Thank you guys. All right, brother. Cool. Uh, let's go to John Owley. John, what's going on, brother? John, hey Michael, can you hear me? Sure can. Uh, I have a question about free selection. So I'm currently working with Corey on my Instagram profile. Well, uh, can um, we do this? Can we only can we do this real quick? Uh, John, can we wait till I want Marshall? We're gonna ask questions right, just sorry. for Marshall right now. Yeah, and, uh, sure. Marshall and I have never discussed pre-selection before, so we'll we'll just we'll discuss that some other time. We'll do that. Um yeah. let's see here. Uh let's go to Steven Rosario. Steven, what's your question? And stand by, Helen. Steven, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, Greg, can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. Uh, so, yeah, once again, kind of echoing what Raj was saying, not every day you get a, a chance to ask questions uh, to, uh, you know, uh, Hall of Famer. But um, so, you know, obviously uh, everyone would agree that, you know, you have you have uh, an incredibly lucrative career. You know, you've reached the pinnacle of, you know, one of the pinnacles of sports. But the question that I had is, do you have anything now in your career um, that has rivaled, um, I guess, so to speak, the heights that you got to achieve uh, in the NFL or in your football career in general? Um, <clears throat> the only thing now, man, is um, is is being the best parent. Like I live through my kids. I just I, I want to see them be successful. I want to see them do well. It's amazing the joy that I get when they when they accomplish something or they do something um, when it's within question, like. Um, having a conversation with my daughter um, about 
moving out, having a roommate, living with someone, like her and her roommate. I'm like, you can do this. Giving her the talk uh, and the belief for her to go out and and just just start adulting. It's that that it 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 gives me um, just as much satisfaction as playing playing ball did. Like I I love love my kids and I love when they are in good spaces in life and they're doing things and they're accomplishing things. Wow. Okay. Yeah, no, that's great. Love it, man. I appreciate it. Uh, Gabe, let's try this one more time. Gabe, is it working for you? Go ahead and unmute yourself, Gabe. You hear me? There we go. Got it. Awesome, brother. What's going on? Uh, I got a question for Marshall. Marshall, has there ever been a point in time in your life where you just kind of felt uncomfortable of changing your whole environment and your whole character? Like the, everything just doesn't feel right, but also at the same time, you have to progress further to make your life a bit more better? Yeah. <clears throat> a lot of times. Um, getting drafted, going to a new team, that's uncomfortable. You, 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 go from, you go from being big man on campus in college, and now you walk into a locker room full of grown-ass men. You know, like football goes from football go from being a fun sport that you play to like there's hopes and dreams and people got to take care of their families based on you holding on to the damn football. So that's an uncomfortable getting traded, going from one team to the next, walking into another locker room. It's uncomfortable. And how did you manage? Um, how did you manage that? Oh, by going through the hard. There's there's no easy way around it. There's no managing it. You just do it. There's no managing it. Like, this is, this is, I want this. I want to be in the NFL. I got to do this. I wanted to go to a different team. I got to do this. And then the, the, the challenging one, the challenging one was retiring, knowing you can't play again, dealing with moving forward, not knowing what that part of life is like. Because when I came into the NFL, um, like maybe like in the eighties is when, players like stop having actual jobs and they started playing football full time guys used to have jobs. They used to sell cars in the off season and play football during, during season. I don't know if you know that that's what, that's what a lot of guys did. And, and when we, you know, when we got, you know, free agency and all of that stuff and we started making big money and, and they started sharing in the profits a little more with us, um, it became, don't think about what you're going to do outside of football or you'll be doing that sooner than you want to. So planning for after football was kind of a short career. Um, and when it's over, like, okay, so what am I going to do now? Should I have started planning earlier? All of that stuff. And for me, I'm just glad because I started to plan early. Like I went in understanding that I wanted to do television how I was going to do it, I didn't know. But when I was in Indianapolis, I um, I did a lot of the behind-the-camera stuff with it, with NBC. When I got to St. Louis, I had my own show on Fox. So I was I was ready to go do television. I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't know what life was going to be like outside of football. Like not having, hold on, wait, camp started. Everybody's going to camp. What the hell's? what am I doing? It took me three years to stop my workout pattern of of like letting my body rest and then working out to develop just, okay, I'm going to work out four to five days a week for the rest of my life. Like it just, it took a while for me to, I, I had to like just, okay, I just got to stop working out for a while <laughs> to allow my body to heal. There's a lot of patterns that we develop and going through the heart is the only way to do it. You know, you got to go through the heart. Sound good, Gabe? Gabe, that answer your question? Love it, man. All right, just a few more. I want one would be respectful of their time. Uh, Billy, what's your question? Billy Lynn? Hey, can you hear me now? Oh, got sure it. Can. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, uh, thanks, Marshall. And yeah, thanks everyone for making this possible. I had a quick question with uh, really the wealth management business, um, at least in terms of your experience. What are some of the common ways that you think that your your wealthiest clients think about money? And is there like a difference uh, versus how they thought of it versus some of your uh, perhaps uh, some of your cl uh, clients that are low, uh, lower on the wealth scale? 
Um, if I can say it in, in any way, um, people with very little money think about spending money and people with a lot of money think about making money. That's that's literally, that's that's what they do. People that have a lot of money we're always in the thought process of how do I get more? How do I double this? How do I triple this? What can I do? And people with a little money, that's all they think about is how can I spend money? Like they're, they're never thinking about the, the saving aspect of it. Their their relationship with money is bad. Uh, they don't understand that money, um, it has an energy behind it. That's why it's called currency. There's a current, there's energy behind money and their relationship with money is bad. Every time they get it, they give it away. They spend it. They don't know how to collect it and gather it and build up the energy, so you can so you can have that nest egg. So you can so you can then have all the things that you want in life. And then when you realize you have all the money, you actually realize you don't want much. You're like, I'm actually cool. I don't need that car. <laughs> that was when I was poor. Having that car mattered, but now that I have the money, I don't really want that car. Got it, got it. Yeah, definitely really insightful. And and it yeah, wonder if I can ask a sort of a second question is it's like uh goes back to your uh, retirement uh sort of conundrum after like the three years after that. What do you think of like uh Mike Tyson just coming back and do you think he can win? Uh I I'm just curious on your thoughts on that. Uh on any itch you want to scratch and everything like that. Hey, let's 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 I I don't wanna I don't wanna be the spoiler of this, but this is an exhibition. All right. This is an, is an exhibition. Um, Mike Tyson getting his old ass in the ring and get punched upside the head. And then he can't speak like, like this is football, boxing. That's why, that's why in golf, there's a senior tour, you know, like, (laughs) like there's, there's no, there's nowhere for us to go. It's a young man thing. You don't you don't step your old ass back in the ring. Like I I don't know if Mike needs to make some money or he just you know he he want to train. But let's be real, man. Let's be real. Awesome, um, awesome. Bill, Billy, the only thing I would say is there's like new treatments and TRT that have happened, and I've seen Mike Tyson lives out here in Las Vegas, and I've seen him. And there was a point in his 40s where he looked like he was like kind of sloughing off and slowing down. He looks like it for. Or I believe, what is he, 56 or 57 now? He looks incredible shape. The other thing is, like, you remember uh, when um, uh, George uh, Foreman, when he got in, I think he was 46 when he got back in the ring, uh, and he did that. The upper body, he's still able to put, like, a ton of power. I'm watching Mike Tyson train, and I'm not saying he's uh, he's going to beat Jake Paul, but Jake Paul is not, like, a super proficient uh, boxer. who I don't, I don't think he fights at 210. Uh, which I think Mike Tyson fights around like 210, 211, somewhere around there. Um, I, if Mike Tyson hits him one time really hard, that's what I'm saying is it's not going to last very long. But we, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? It's it's tough to say. It's just interesting enough to where I'm probably going to watch. Bootleg. Awesome. That's it. I'm gonna, there it is. I'm gonna boot, I'm going to bootleg it off some Chinese website, but not pay for it. <laughs> that's just interesting enough for that. <laughs> yep. Thank Beautiful. you for the invitation. Okay, nice, nice. Uh, DJ Rez. You had one more question. Yes. Hi. Um, and this might be a question for maybe just for Michael, but maybe Marshall's inputs would matter too. I lost a three thousand dollar gold <laughs> bracelet last weekend while out party. I saw it. It was you know, it was I was there. It was a party. Yes, my home my home <laughs> was got it. No. <laughs> so I was with a girl. She slept next to me, and I woke up in the middle of the night. I'm like, oh my god, it's missing. So the question is. How do you trust people? I mean, I don't have much, right? This that is more of a question for Marshall than me. I think you got this backwards. <laughs> well, I guarantee you Marshall's woken up in certain places and been like, where's my shit? I guarantee you it's fucking happened. It probably happened at San Diego State. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, and when it comes to dating and then sort of screening for these, or how, how do you trust somebody you go home with? Like, how do you do that? Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to give you uh, a couple of things here. So I have different circles of trust 
And like, if you're in my inner circle, then yeah, those people know the passwords, a power of attorney, those kind of people. Then there's another circle outside of that. And these are people I really like. These are most of the people I work with. Most of the guys in the MOA are in that circle. Then there's another circle about people. I just don't know them that well. Like if I got to know them better, maybe I'd like them. Then there's another circle of people I don't like, but I have to work with. And then the final circle is people I avoid. And, um, and the thing is for me, it's like, if you're going to bring a girl home, I, I personally have my place set up with cameras. If somebody's going to take something, they're going to get caught. I live in a high rise. There's cameras everywhere. That's generally what I would do. But the other thing is like, I don't care enough initially when I meet someone for them to disappoint me. Cause I'm not like invested in the situation, especially like, like juicy J said, they, for everybody, they had every party. They ain't going to be loyal, not to anybody. I just don't worry about it. Until they prove to me that they're worthy of something, someone I'm going to worry about, then it's going to be an issue. But the thing is, like, I've been in situations before where I've had, you know, girls over back when I was single. And if there's a pistol in the house that gets locked in the safe, same thing with any of the jewelry, any of the other stuff, you know, I that's the only thing I could tell you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Marshall, you had some situation like this? If I got a question whether I trust you, then that means I don't trust you. That's it. Like, I either trust you or I don't. I don't have different levels. Like, I either trust you or I don't. If I don't trust you, you got to yeah. get out. Ain't no sleeping over. You got to go. Kayla, anybody anybody stole your shit? Girl, come over, do makeup, and then all of a sudden a bag is missing. Did that ever happen? Kayla, you still there? Uh, yeah, sorry. Hold on. I'm having some mic issues. Beautiful. <laughs> Kate says, says can't leave a draw. The, 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 the funny part is when they take it and pretend on like. Second. Yeah, they didn't take it. You, you know, when they. No, 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 no. Oh, no. I was going to give it back, though. Yeah. I was going to give it back for sure. I'm sure that's what she's saying right now, Rez. Uh, I will tell guys all this. Uh, and obviously, you know, I'm friends with Dan Blazarian. He was the one who got me to put cameras in every room in my place. So there are cameras in every room in my place for specifically for reasons like that. Uh, and also, so there's no misunderstanding uh, at the end of the night. One other thing I'll, I'll give you guys, as you guys level up and you make more money and people figure out that you make more money, let me give you another piece of advice. At the end of every date, no matter how it happens, especially if you end up having sex with her, afterwards, you're going to send her a text message and you're going to say something to the effect of, I had a great time. Let's meet up again next week. If she hearts it, gives anything in the affirmative whatsoever, she can't go back and then change the story to something else happened. So I would send a text message, get a positive uh, reply. Because you just, you know, most women are not like this, but occasionally you'll run into a Nikki Hill or an Amber Heard or someone like that. So you got to protect yourself. That's the only thing I would tell you. Um, cool. Let's go this one more time. Uh, Kayla, let's go. Kayla, try it again. Yeah. Can you hear me? Beautiful. Awesome. Great. Nice. All right. Let's do, uh, I think this is the, we'll do uh, Lieutenant Ty Buchanan, United States Army. What's going on, Ty? What's your question? Hey, what's up, Mike? So for Marshall, Developing the mindset of a top peak performer, what tools would you use to, to sort of develop that? Does it just come from putting the reps in, affirmations, visualization, mentors? Like what sort of tools do you think were the most powerful for you to develop that mind state or that mindset? Um, you know, I was, it started with me very young. I'm the youngest of six boys. Uh, so uh, the proper mindset was was instilled. I got my butt kicked a lot. I lost a lot. And I think that I think that people that lose a lot develop the that heart that you need to continue to go through it. Um as I told you guys, I played football and I never I, I never won a championship. So I lost often. But but what what that told me was that I, if you're going to continue playing and you lose a lot, that means you love the game. Because I wasn't making money at that point in time. I love the game. So you have to build up, you have to build up your mind to enjoy the process and the journey, regardless of the results. Hmm. And when you can do that, when you can do that, once you start getting the results, you're going to continue on a journey. You're going to continue to do the process. You're going to continue to do the things that make you successful. You're going to continue competing, even if you have to start competing with yourself. It's like one of the one of the things that um that I did was uh, when when I was in Indianapolis, I used to always drive to Chicago and go watch Michael Jordan play. Um, and uh, Mike and I we became good friends. And I remember when I won MVP of the league, I was like, Hey, Mike, what do I do now? 
Because I've been chasing trying to be the best player in the league. Now that I'm the best player in the league, what do I do now? He was like, now you have to find the things that you're weak at and get better at that. So you can start chasing the person you were. Because mm. if you if you just go back, if you just go back with who you were and try to play next year, they gain ground on you. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, Kenny Smith tells a story about one summer playing basketball with Michael Jordan back when they were at UNC together. And he's like, he, he knew when Michael was a freshman and Kenny was a sophomore, he's like, I can handle the ball better than he could. He couldn't go left. And so he would, he would handle up on Michael when he was a freshman next year. He said, Michael came back and he was, he was better at his left than Kenny was like, he just improved on this thing that that was his weakness. And then he was like, at that point, that's when Kenny was like, this guy's a killer. Like nobody's ever going to stop this kid. So that that is that's absolutely true. Beautiful. Uh Mike Hogan. Mike, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey Marshall. Uh this is amazing content. This is my first time listening to Michael. Uh I mean, I listen to your clips on Instagram, but a big fan. And uh Marshall, I mean like a surprise, because I'm a I'm St. Louis, St. Louis Rams fan. So uh g- grew up in Clayton. Uh, shared a beer with you at Kilkenny's, if you remember that place. Nice, nice, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, you were just a solid guy, and I was a fanboy. And uh, you just, I don't, I don't know how, you, I don't know how you got rid of me, but you did. And uh, no, but you're a good guy, stand up guy. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. And uh, Michael, thank you for deep diving with Azir Hakeem and uh, Ricky Pearl bringing them up. And uh, great question. So this is awesome. Awesome, thank- man. Well, I appreciate that. Last question, Gabe. Gabe, what's your question, brother? Uh, I got a question for you, Michael. Um, yeah. What is like, the best way to naturally boost testosterone? Because I know I know uh, you mentioned wild yams. Yeah, yeah real, real quick. You no, know, wild yams is how you make synthetic testosterone. You need to go listen to Andrew H- H- Andrew Huberman, Doctor Andrew Huberman. He's a professor of neuroscience at Stanford, and he's got these two herbs that naturally boost testosterone. And then later on, I would not recommend anybody try TRT unless you're 35, maybe 35 or older. Because mm-hmm. right now I'm taking a yeah. uh, Ali and just testo- uh, testosterone. Yeah, I think I think the 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 Ali is one of the two herbs, but it's supposed to boost up your testosterone up a hundred points. Um, I'm mm-hmm. not really sure about that, but that I, I just don't recommend anybody tries TRT under the age of unless you have hypogonadism under the age of like 30, 28, something like that. If you if you you know you got kicked in the nuts by a mule and you, they don't work anymore and you just don't have any testosterone, then I, then I could see it happening. But yeah, it's it's one of these uh, interesting uh, issues. Beautiful. There you go. Uh, Ty just wrote the two herbs down there in the uh, chat. Got it. Appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Marshall, Kayla, do you guys want to summarize real quick? Like what it is that how people can get a hold of you and then uh, get involved with virtuity? I'll let Marshall handle that. Marsh. Yep. Yeah. Give me one second. I'm a literally. Hannah still on here. Uh, oh, Hannah is on here. Is. So on all social media handles, I'm at Marshall Falk. Um, just hit me up. Uh, any tw- any any questions around um, and uh, around the financial service industry, uh, any type of index funds, um, I- anything in that in that area that, in that arena. Um, I just put my uh, my my email in there as well in the chat. So um, just reach out uh, or on social media, and uh, we'll connect with you and answer all your questions. Beautiful, Hannah. Hannah, uh, looks like I think I don't think we have audio there, Hannah. I would just just switch the microphone. Uh, one thing I will tell you guys is you this me? is a situation. Yeah, for sure. Go ahead, Hannah. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and I'll put our website into the chat box as well. That you guys all have that. I think did Kayla do that? No, I just put my Instagram handle in there. You guys can also reach out to me there through my Instagram. Any financial questions? Anything about? uh virtuity or wfg you guys can hit me up as well um in case you know marshall's a busy man in case he doesn't respond i will yep and i'll put my email address in here as well happy to answer any and all questions and uh you guys hannah, can was this when, was, was this when you were starting running back hannah i'm sorry hannah, was I went, kayla kayla was this <laughs> when you were starting tailback oh my god what this was? <laughs> you RB, were you right were you rb1 were you rb1 right here is that what's going on <laughs> yeah you guys yep. can definitely go check out uh kayla right there yeah that's me 
Nice. Okay. Um, yeah, guys, send me the links and I'm going to put all the links in the show notes. Marshall, I really appreciate this again. If you're ever, if you guys are ever in Las Vegas, I can handle up, take care of everything you guys need. I'd love to have you on the podcast at some point. Love that you guys are talking about this. For those of you who are a bit more successful, you're coming into, you know, you're, you followed a lot of the advice. You're getting up to hundred K a month. 300K a month, a million a month, whatever. And you're going to have a lot of cash that's sitting around there. Like for instance, for when you are in that type of situation, if you need some more solid advice as far as what to do with that money where you don't want to spend every day trying to figure out how to do it, consider people assisting you with your passive investing. And I would talk to Hannah and uh, Kayla here. Yeah, also and for everybody else that's not at those levels, guys, we can help you figure out how to earn more money. And we, we, we help everybody. It's not just for people that have money. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, thank cool. you. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. Thank all you guys for your questions. And I will see all of you in two weeks. If you guys are in men of action, uh, or if you're curious about joining men of action, just go to our, just hit me up on Instagram. I'll put you in our free school server. We're doing this in two weeks from now. And then for those of you who are in MOA, I will see you.